the planning committee and apologies for the delay in getting started. We'll be technical definitely at the start. So sort of the members and officers are welcome here and also those joining us uh, either remotely or are just watching us uh, online. Um, so item one then on our agenda is any apologies. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I just want to tender an apology at this stage. Uh, that I will have to leave at 5.45 p.m. as I have another engagement. So hopefully we'll be finished by that time, but we'll see how we go. Thank you, Chair. No problem, Councillor. Optimistic. Councillor McGuire. Thank you, Mark. Glenn, thanks, Glenn. I, I think you may have already been uh, uh, made aware that Councillor Barry Michael Duff will not be with us and Councillor Thomas O'Reilly. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, no other apologies. Um, Item two then is to sign the minutes and confidential minutes of the meeting held on 26th of January 22 and to sign the minutes of the previous meeting held on 16th of February 22. And uh, that has been sorted. And I'm going to bring Councillor Gardy in here at the outset, just Councillor Gardy. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you for letting me in and, you know, whispered to you earlier. Um, Chair, I just want to bring to members' attention a very quick and good news item. Last Saturday, a uh, young boy, third year at St Michael's, uh, we fell from Trillick, Sean Corey, was crowned Junior Boys Irish School Cross Country Champion. Um, he's a, just a fantastic young athlete. He's a great soccer player for Bonn and Mallard and great Gaelic player for Trillick. I think he's even been scouted by teams across the water. So um, on, the, on the negative side, we could lose him to bigger uh, bigger fields, um, a pastures green maybe otherwise, but just it was a great achievement. It's the first athlete from Fermanagh School to achieve this. And like I say, he's a very modest and talented young man. I've asked the chair um, if he would be agreeable to send a letter of congratulations to Sean and uh, wish him well for the future from him on, on this great achievement as well. So I uh, just to formally propose that chair and I have mentioned it to the, the chairman of the council. I think he's happy. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Thompson? Thank you, uh, Chairman. And just with regard to uh, Councillor Gardy's proposal, I'm more than happy to send a letter of congratulations to Mr. Corey. Thank yeah. you. And I think we all join uh, the proposer and seconder in, in our support and congratulations uh, to the young athlete. <laughs> okay, um, members, so um, item. Three then is the declaration of interests. Uh, any declarations of interest? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Chair. It's uh, agenda item seven, application six, LA 10-2020-114-F. I, I was previously contacted by the applicant before I became a member of this committee. Okay, that's noted. Councillor Irvine. Thanks, Chair. It's not necessarily a declaration of interest, but really a declaration of intent. Because of the amount of call-in items under item 7, it is extremely doubtful that we're going to get through the complete list. And it's just to maybe forewarn those towards the end of the list that they may not be taken this evening. It may have to go to another meeting. It's just that people are waiting for a full four, four hours. It's just purely a, an observation, Chair. Thank you. Yep, that's a fair point, and we have in the event that we run over provision for another meeting, so that's has been thought about as well, councillors. Um, okay, um, item four then is matters arising from twenty sixth of January, twenty twenty two. You have the minutes there, and uh, I'm not going to go through each page, but if you have any items. Matters arising. Okay, I take it no matters arising. Uh, item five then is matters arising from the meeting on the 16th of February 2022. <clears throat> And I have no indications uh, that item. So I'm going to move on then uh, to item six, and that's to consider four files for delegation by the planning committee, paper A, for your reference. And I'll ask Darren to introduce the application number one. 
Uh, good afternoon, members. Uh, just before we get into the applications, um, there has been a request received from the planning agent for the application on the paper B application number four, which is LA 10 2021 It's the full application for the retention of repair semi detached dwellings, including removal of first floor rear window elevation windows. So, first floor rear elevation windows, provision of additional side elevation windows, and new first floor layout. The applicant then is S and A Monaghan Builders Limited. And the location then is sites 25 and 27 lower retreat uh, in Oma. The request has come in from the agent um, and was received and it states that he would res respectfully request a deferral of the file for one month. As part of ongoing negotiations with the applicant and other stakeholders, the agent inadvertently missed the deadline for the request for speaking rights for the file and as a result was unable to obtain the same for today. With this in mind, the agent has asked if the application could be deferred until next month uh, so as to allow them to ensure that they have obtained speaking rights and ultimately allow them to present the opportunity to present the applicant's case in front of the committee. Uh, it says apologies for the timing of the request. However, this was in large part due to circumstances outside of their control. Uh, I'd just like to just put that to members, uh, the request to members, just to see because we do have uh, speaking rights from one of the objectors. So if we were to defer the file, if we could do that at this stage and save them the time uh, waiting on the system or agree that we would go on with the application and determine it today. So as I say, that's paper B, appendix four, LA 10, 2021 and request from the agent for a deferral for next month to request speaking rights. Councillor Irvine. Yeah, it's a question that might have to be directed maybe at Kim in regard to just the protocol. In the light that we may have to um, reconvene towards the end of the month because of the weight of the agenda. And if this were item were actually on the reconvened agenda, is it possible then for speaking rights to be uh, reapplied for if it's a postponed meeting? My understanding is that it's not, but maybe just double check with. Uh, yeah, I just want to check with that. respect to that. Protocol isn't isn't clear on that one, uh, Chair. It really just refers to the standard applications for speaking rights as being the Monday before the the committee, and um, which is the normal one. It doesn't make reference to um, a deferral uh, or or to a reconvened committee. Um, and what we, our practice has been that speaking rights would just carry forward um, in the event that we we. Uh, reconvene on the second day. Um, yeah, the only reason I'm asking is, I mean, basically in the spirit of goodwill, but uh, my goodwill is eaten up with people coming in who don't make the deadlines and go, go forward. We have possibly a buy here. If we actually say we're going to put this to the back of the agenda by agreement now, and it's doubtful whether we take it today, and it then goes on to a reconvene meeting. The agent then has the opportunity to apply, and we would probably make the objectors aware that it's highly unlikely that it's going to be dealt with today, and it will be dealt with at the reconvene meeting, it's thereby not keeping them uh, overly involved here as well. It's merely a suggestion. Uh, I'm, I'm not in favour of a full deferral for a month. We've had this before. So that is my compromise proposal. I'm willing to hear other members. Uh, it might speaking be appropriate thinking. maybe to ask Philip if he's uh, able to just to comment on that because it's a bit a bit unclear really from the protocol. If Philip's in. Philip, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, I've just been trying to get the um the, the my own copy of the protocol open in front of me there a little bit unsuccessfully, but I would tend to agree with with um, Darren's approach in relation to the particular matter. Councillor Gardy, you want thank you, thank you, Philip. Councillor Gardy, uh, you wanted to know that as well. Well, just to clarify, did Philip mean Councillor Irvine's approach? I think as Darren didn't suggest a way a way forward. So yeah, just it's probably Councillor Irvine. Yeah, so, sorry, apologies. Yes, <laughs> I didn't mean. Indeed, the 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 idea was to uh, address it at this stage rather than than leaving it. Yeah. What was that? Just a, an agreement with 
Yeah. yeah, to address it. I'm going to have to dock him an hour's wages there, Philip. <laughs> um, yes, well, I think Robert today was mere a comment, but I think he then did make it a proposal. But if that's the case, so be it, Chair. And I think that's a compromise that if the members are content and can move on. Yep. Happy to second what Robert suggested. He did make it a proposal at the very end, isn't that correct? For clarity, maybe repeat the proposal, Councillor Everett. For clarity, uh, I am proposing that we put this uh, item to the end of our agenda today, right at the end. Uh, and it is likely that it will not be taken because of the length of the agenda, and it will automatically go on to the reconvene meeting. That then will give the agent the uh, chance to apply. And we should also advise the objector at this stage that it is 99% uh, likely not to be taken today. But my proposal is to put it at the end of the agenda for uh, consideration today. Okay, members, so that's the proposal that's been seconded. Uh, are members agreed to move that item to the end of paper B? Councillor McGuire? Just a second there. Thanks, Glenn. I was just thinking there is similar to the advice that other chairs received at other committees. It is within your gift to move the item on the agenda from item four to, to come in after item eight. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, without the proposing that, I think we've been previously informed as chairs that we can move items on the agenda. So I think actually if you simply move item four to come after item eight, and then if we're approaching the time this evening, then we can make a formal proposal what we do, is whether it's for the reconvened meeting or the deferral for the month. Yeah, move application four to after application eight. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm happy to do that if it, if it facilitates things in any way, although it is a bit unclear. Um, yep, we're all in agreement in any case with, with my decision there. Yes, Councillor? Sorry, sorry. Yep. That's all right. okay. I can go with Thank that you. one, that's fine. No problem, Councillor. Okay, members, so um, agreed on that. So item six then is the four files for decision then. Yeah, we can indeed. Yep, no problem. Um, just to confirm then, uh, members, the position on that application. So. Uh, paper B, Appendix 4, the application LA10 2021-0929, which is for the retention of the dwellings uh, in OMA. That application has been pushed back now uh, and will be heard after Paper B, uh, application number 8, which is likely to be at the reconvened meeting. Uh, and I know there are speaking rights requested, and if they are listening in, just to advise them that that is the position. So the application will be unlikely to be heard today, and we will inform them of what the date and time of the reconvened meeting is. Okay. okay. Okay, so moving on then, paper A then, application number one um, is LA10 2021-0507, a full application by the Chairman of the Board of Governors uh, at St. Kevin's College in Lesnesky for a supplementary building to provide additional facilities to the existing college. The recommendation then is to approve planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the one reason. So on the screen then, members, you can see the site location plan then. Um, I'm sure members know the college well. Uh, the college itself then is identified on the screen and the new building then is the, the darker uh, shaded uh, extended area at the top right, which is beside the yellow star. Well, again, the block plan then shows the existing college. Uh, the new building then is the right hand side within a, a green space uh, within the existing grounds of the college. And that's just the aerial photograph. So looking down, you can see the existing sort of college site and the building then will be in the area of the yellow star at the back. You can see the relationship of the site then uh, to the adjacent third party houses, which are further forward up closer to the road. So the floor plan then, you can see the typical school floor plan with the central corridor and then the rooms coming off it. And then the first floor, uh, again going upstairs, uh, typical school layout. Elevations then uh, are on the screen, so that's the front and the rear view, although really it's the side elevations uh, because of the orientation of the building. So that's the two sides. The lower one then will be facing out towards the, the side boundary. 
And then the side views, as I say, that's really the front and back. Uh, so the C is the front of the building facing one of the public road with the, the sign on it. So well designed, high quality building, good uh, quality finishes. And then just a, a 3D visual of the proposed building. So the left hand slide then just shows a, a photograph looking in towards the site. Uh, and you can see then the location of the building then will be in the green space, the right hand side of the building. And then the right hand slide shows the the site on the ground. So overall members the recommendation is to approve the application for the reasons listed within the report and uh, subject to the one condition. Okay members. <clears throat> Have a recommendation, Councillor Feely. Sorry, Councillor McGuire, I think. Uh, Morgan, currently, yeah, happy to propose the recommendation. Okay. Councillor Feely. Yeah, and I'll second it. Okay, uh, proposed and second. Is everyone in agreement? Yeah. All agreed then. Okay, members, so the recommendation then was to approve permission, members have granted permission subject to the one condition. Okay, moving on then to application two. LA 10 2021 0159F. So application number two is a full application. Uh, LA 10 2021 0159. Uh, it's for two semi detached houses with single story returns uh, as an amended design to previous approval on the site uh, under L 2004 2269F, uh, which was a housing development. The applicant then is Jay Gilmore, and the location then is 50 metres northeast of Reed Hall, Castletown Road, Monet. And the recommendation is to approve planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the three conditions. You'll note from the report members that the application is a local application. However, it attracts material objections from a statutory consultee and the officer's recommendation then is to approve. So the application must be determined by the committee. Uh, so I'll just go through the, the application then. So the red line of the site uh, is a small rectangular roadside plot. Uh, adjacent to the public road, and you can see then the blue is the uh, wider housing development uh, within the the area. The proposed block plan then shows the two semi-detached houses sitting up close to the road with the parking uh, around the side, and two individual accesses coming out on the Castle Town Road, and an amenity space out the back. The proposed front elevation then is a typical semi-detached house. Um, so you'll note from the report members the issue and the material objections from the statute consultee relate to the, the location of the, the cyst, um, which is the back of the site. Excuse me. So um, on the screen then is the scheduled area around the cyst, uh, which is in red. Um, and I just put that on because uh, I didn't know what it was to be honest at the time. So a, a, a cyst is a burial site, a stony, stone lined burial site dating from the Bronze Age, uh, which contains human remains. It's a scheduled monument. Uh, which is afforded statutory protection under the provisions of the Historic Monuments and Archaeological Objects Order uh, and is also protected uh, under planning policy by PPS 6 and the SPPS. Um, so the application in site does include the area of the scheduled monument and of the, the cyst. Uh, so you can see on the right hand side the, the houses are up at the road frontage. You then have their back gardens and then the rectangular shape uh, of the scheduling monument is out to the rear. It measures about 15 metres by 15 metres. So the Department for Communities has advised the Council that it is not satisfied that the services can be achieved without adverse effects upon the scheduled area. They've asked for further information before a planning decision can be made to clarify the potential impacts of these works upon the scheduled area and advise that this may necessitate a redesign of the proposed works. That's the that's the location on the ground. Members, you can see the, the houses have commenced on site and the protected area, the scheduled area, has been kept free. It's the yellow star. And our buildings then are roughly in the position of the red rectangle. And as I say, the critical issue from DFC is the, the impact upon the scheduled area. It doesn't relate to the house or the garden area. It's the pipes from the uh, houses heading out to the rear uh, to connect into the existing public infrastructure. So you can see those on the screen uh, coming out from the back of the properties and they run around the cyst. So they are in parallel with the red line uh, on the screen. So the view of officers is that there's no works within the cyst itself. Uh, they go around the edge of the, the cyst um, and the scheduled area. Um, 
<coughs> excuse me, there's also uh, um, scheduled monument protection afforded to the, the area. Uh, so the applicant uh, will have to get that from the Department for Communities uh, and agree that with them separately and outside of the planning process. So the view of officers is really there's no impact on the setting of the SIS, there's no impact on the, the scheduling monument itself. In terms of the <coughs> excuse me, the other issues that they've raised, you can see on the right hand side is the previous approval for the housing. Um, and it's identified the SIST is identified by the yellow star, and the approval has a note on it saying the scheduled monument area within the site uh, is identified and no structures are built over the same and is to be maintained as a garden area only. So the officers cannot go back now and revisit the scheme and redesign it. Uh, the area is protected under the, the previous approval uh, as a green area, um, which is to be transferred to a green belt company. And again, no structures are to be built over the site in the future, and the area is to be maintained in its original site, uh, with a note even that the grass will not be trimmed. So as I remember, the, the uh, view of uh, the request by the uh, statute consul T for the further information is not sustained for reasons listed within the report, and officers uh, are of the view to um, recommend approval of the application subject to the conditions that are listed within the report. Uh, and there are four of those at the end of the report. Okay, thanks, Darren. Councillor McClary. Thank you, Chair. Uh, given that report, Darren, and the fact that there's uh, there's no indication that there's uh, Iron Age sat satellites around the, the Bronze Age cyst, which is traditionally found in Fermanagh. That's that's a single site. It's 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 not going to interfere with it. It would be the long term maintenance would be the major concern. If it's going to be built round, who's actually going to take responsibility for it? Whilst grass won't harm it, trees and overgrowth will will damage it and, and that's what will will be the key thing. But if that was clarified, I think that there's there's no issue with the plan and the building going round it because there's nothing there. The cis freestanding and as long as there's no pipe work near it, there's no indication of any iron aid satellites around it. So I, I can't see a problem in proposing that we go with it. Well just in terms of the assist itself, um the previous approval for the housing on the site uh, was conditioned to have an archaeological survey. Um and uh, I understand that was all uh, completed uh, and raised no issues. So our application is purely looking at the impact on this small cyst area and the scheduled area. Uh, and as you say the pipework appears to go around that. So there's none going directly through it and they will require separate scheduled monument consent from the department who will look after the, the ground and how it's maintained, et cetera. Uh, and in terms of the maintenance of it, it's related, it, you can see on the screen there, it relates back to the original approval. So it's going to be maintained as open space, but uh, it's not even to be touched really, it's to be left and kept free. Okay, and like that, you're happy to make that proposal, Councillor? Yes, thank you, Chair. Okay, um, Councillor Irvine. I think several of the issues that I have have been clarified both with John's questions and Darren's reply, so I'm happy to second the proposal to approve. Thank you. And Councillor Feely. Thank, thanks, Chair. I was going to come in second as well, and John is going to clarify the stuff as well. It's um, it, it probably get untidy looking off the wild down long grass. There, there, there was no, it's not farmland. Is the, is the developer still owns it, or will it not be grazed for sheep or anything? Like no. And I'm glad that the pipes is isn't going to be interfering on the on the actual. Um, yeah, the, the, the maintenance issue, as the councillors, relates back to the original approval, um, and it's not really within our discretion at the moment to revisit that. Um, so certainly I can go back through that and uh, see what's going on and, and contact the agent to make sure it is maintained and looked after properly for you. Can, we can do that outside of the planning application. Okay. Okay, so that's proposed and seconded uh, in support of the recommendation. Are we all in agreement to approve? Okay, thank you. Okay, members, so the recommendation then was to approve permission uh, for the reasons listed within the report and subject to three conditions. Uh, so members have granted permission subject to those three conditions. Okay, um, application number three is LA 10 2021 123F. Okay, number three then, members, LA 10 2021 123F. So it's a full application for canoe landing steps. Uh, at the Arnie River, uh, an access road parking area, access footpath, uh, along with the demolition of the existing roadside wall, erection of fencing, and a height restriction barrier. The applicant then is Outdoor Recreation NI, uh, and the location then is in Belcoo. 
The recommendation then is to approve planning permission for the reasons listed within the report uh, and subject to the conditions. Uh, you'll note the application is a local application, members, but as before you as the council has an interest in the lands. Uh, just to give you an update, members, you'll note from the report uh, the DFI comments were outstanding. They have now replied uh, and have requested amendments to the plans. Um, these are uh, relating to the position of gates and fences and other minor revisions that don't really have any consequence to the application. Uh, those drawings and amendments have now been received uh, and uh, will be sent over to Roads for final confirmation. However, given that there have no the changes in, that they're requesting are of no consequence to the proposal and there's no third parties affected by the proposal, uh, officers would be of the view that we're content to proceed on uh, with the recommendation and presentation today, uh, subject to any decision being made uh, or based upon the final roads drawings uh, that are ultimately agreed with them. There would be one additional condition suggested then um, that the visible displays would be provided at the access in accordance with those final plans. So just take you through the, the details in members on the screen then you can see the the location of the site then on the right hand side is uh, an aerial photograph uh, with the site identified in red uh, on the left then is the site location plan. Block plan then uh, it's quite a big plan so I've broken it down members into, into individual uh, sort of areas so you can see the access at the top of the site coming in uh, and then going down uh, along the edge of the road down to the river where the canoe steps will be so if you just break that down so the entrance then coming in off the road um, the existing wall will be removed uh, to allow the access to come in there'll be new pathways to connect into existing paths uh, and then the road will um, curve round down towards the the rest of the site there will be the uh, height restriction barriers, uh, 2.3 metres in height, those will be put on the, in the front of the access. Internally then there is uh, car parking available uh, and you can see that by the within the red rectangle. And then if you go on down the site you can see then there's a turning area for larger vehicles so people with trailers etc can turn within the site um, and then the canoe landing steps are down at the bottom uh, adjacent to the, the Belcoo River. Uh, location then you can see it's right beside the, the uh, edge of the council area and uh, access then will be onto the Air Force Lago Road. So as I members, the recommendation then is to approve plan permission uh, for the reasons listed within the report, subject to the four conditions within the report and an additional condition that the visible display is on the protected route uh, are provided uh, prior to the commencement of any use of the site. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Uh, Councillor Irvine. Yeah, no, I'm happy enough with the um, the proposed works. Uh, I know the site have passed it all, often enough. It's ju just uh, a point of clarity because you've t used two names for the river. You've used Arnie River in the paper and you've got Belcoo River on the slides. And I presume because it's connecting Upper and Lower Loch McNean, as Councillor Feely well knows, uh, I presume it's the Belcoo River rather than the Arnie River because the Arnie River does not start, in my estimation, until just around Gorta Toll mm -hmm. at the lower end of Lower Loch McNean. Yeah. Um, given the, uh, that issue, councillors, could I ask we defer this to the next yeah. meeting till I clarify that? I, with, I'm not with trying to be <laughs> snippy about this, but yeah. we've said before if we don't get the proper mm -hmm. um, descriptor be. right in the papers, uh, yeah. we could be going away. So, could we defer uh, this to the next meeting? I, I'll propose we defer it. I'm happy enough with the contents, but I think we need to get the, the language right. Thank you. Spotted. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and judging by what has been said there, I'm happy to second that we defer it until our next meeting. Thank you. And all in agreement with that deferral, yeah? Yes. Uh, so yes, members. So just in relation to that last application, um, 
just to confirm, paper B, Appendix 3, Application Number 3, LA 10, 2021-1283, will be deferred until the next meeting. Okay. Um, so, members, uh, Application 4 uh, is LA 10, 2019-1446-RM. I will ask Martin to take us through the application. Um, hello, members. How are you doing? Um, so, application four is a uh, proposed residential development with uh, associated site works, landscaping, foul water treatment plant, and a water pumping station for 125 units. That includes um, 22 detached, 74 semi detached, eight townhouses, and 21 apartments. And the location is at lands at 40 Strathroy Road, Oma. Um, and the recommendation is to approve. Um, Plan permission subject to 16 conditions. Okay, so here's the site location uh, map. So the site is outlined by the yellow star. Um, so this is located beside um, the new Strathroy Link Road. So you can see the site outlined in red, and the yellow line is the new road. Um, and the site actually meets the, the, the existing Strathroy Road. Um, so the junction is just, the T-junction that, that we know is just there at the, at the side of the site. You can see Strathroy Dairies to the north, um, the northeast of the site as well. So when looking from the Strathroy Road, heading back towards the Strathroy Link Road, the site is actually just in front of you. Um, so as you turn left, Along the new road, it's 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 an elevated site and parts and other parts are um, relatively low lying. And this uh, view is taken from the Strathroy Road with the dairy situated to the left hand side. So you're actually going back in towards the town. So you're traveling from the north to the south, and that's the back of the site. Um, and this view is taken from the Strathroy Link Road itself. So the site is positioned to the left there, and you can see in this part the site's quite elevated. Um, but as you approach uh, towards the junction, you can see the way the land falls away. The access is already in place. Uh, I think this was carried out while road service were actually constructing the road. Um, this application had previously been subject um, to an outline permission for residential development, so the principle had already been established. Um, so in terms of the actual layout of the site, um, this shows the internal road layout. Um, and you can see the existing access to the bottom of the screen, um, and the road will continue continue on. Um, probably the landscaping plan is probably a better way to maybe uh, identify all the different houses. Um, so you can see that on the on the access point on the entrance in, the houses will not be immediately at the roadside. They're situated about ten meters back. Um, so a bond is proposed as well. So there will be limited views of the development. When traveling along the frontage of the of the of the site, and um, the views will be probably from from longer distances back along the Strathroy Link Road and the Strathroy Road. Um, so you can see here is also an area of open space proposed, uh, and that's um, to the top of the site. That's there's already existing deciduous trees and 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 and, and hedging already there, and that's proposed to be um, kept. So I, t I mentioned the bond. The proposal is to create a bond along the Strathroy Road. And this bond is proposed um, for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, it's to uh, integrate the houses into the site and maintain their privacy. But secondly, it's also um, to ensure that there will be no uh, effects from the nearby dairy in terms of noise, nuisance and smell. Um, the, the fence which is located on top of the bond, is um, to be maintained by the management company, um, who will also control the open space within the site. So in terms of the dwellings, as I said, there's a mixture of house types. Um, here you can see the, the, the detached um, properties, um, an example of some semi or more detached, semi-detached. Um, and there's also a number of townhouses, um, and they're located to the west of the site. Um, so an example of the townhouses. Um, there's also apartments proposed, and they're located to the northeast of the site. 
the apartments are proposed um, in this location uh, due to the proximity to the dairy. So uh, the apartments require a lower standard um, of amenities of a, or a lower amenity value than, than residential properties. And they are also overlooking the open space. So this is the apartment block. So it's in, it's in, a, in, a, in, a, in a T shaped um, formation with proposed parking um, to the front of the apartment block. Um, so the recommendation is to approve uh, plan of permission um, uh, subject to conditions. Thank you, Martin. So we have a recommendation there. Um, opportunity for any questions, our officer. Councillor McClary. Thank you. Obviously, uh, a great topic of discussion for us as councillors is, uh, is this is a self-contained treatment plant and foul water pumping station. And then it also has the the, the management company. Uh, we have two cases ongoing within our council area. So it's, it's really what safeguards are there to ensure that the contractor will fulfill all their requirements to meet all the obligations that they're they're undertaking without you know, we, we've ended up with two already in, in the area you know uh, that and it's always going to be in the back of our mind as councillors when people come to us how what what are the safeguards that we're putting in place before we let these people start building so in terms of the management company we have a condition um on the permission that uh, that, that that they must come to the council the plan department prior to commencement of works to indicate their what what their plan is and we'll agree that um in terms of the the wastewater treatment works so it's a private treatment works um it will discharge to a nearby water course that's separate consent required under schedule six um and that's really outside of the planning process so they need to be able to provide that after the permission is if the permission must be granted um and that's what they have to do Bring in all here a second. Um, just in, in response to your query as well, uh, Councillor McClory, uh, just to uh, make you aware, we're currently uh, taking forward a a project with Bulgan Control. Um, so uh, it'll be a project between Bulgan Control and Planning where um, whenever Bulgan Control is notified of a commencement of development on site, then uh, we'll get notification of that as well. Um, and then we'll be able to check at that stage where are all pre-commencement conditions in terms of roads, your sewage uh, treatment plant has been complied with. Um, and then if it hasn't, then we'll be able to take enforcement action fairly quickly. And if need be, stop the development before uh, it progresses the material stage. Councillor McLeary. Thank you. I, I think that... That addresses what are what are my concerns with it. I mean, it, it looks like an amazing development, and, and knowing that area, you know, they've, they've taken into consideration a lot of the environmental stuff. It's just in the back of my mind, knowing what we've previously come across at, at a later stage, to, to know that those safeguards are in place and that something can be done quickly rather than than long term. Then I, I would be happy to propose at this stage. Okay, Councillor Dehan. Yes, thank you, Char uh, Chair, and I'd like to thank Martin for his uh, report and Martin and Paul for their uh, clarification regarding issues of concern. Um, uh, I, I want to second uh, this uh, planning approval. Chair, I think it will provide uh, much needed housing of mixed type uh, to the area. And uh, I, I think that we have received the reassurances that uh, we require uh, that the residents there will be protected into the future. So I'm happy, happy to second, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's all been proposed and seconded uh, in support of the officer's recommendation to approve. Are we all in agreement? All agreed? Thank you. So the recommendation is to approve plan of permission for the reasons listed in the report subject to 16 conditions.
Okay, members, we're moving on now to um, agenda item seven, and uh, that's eight delegated files called in for decision by the planning committee. Uh, and there is speaking rights in respect of um, these applications. And at the at that mo at that appropriate time, I will invite people forward um, for the speaking rights. Um, so paper B then for members information and the first application uh, is application number one, LA 10, 2021, 1201F. Darn, introduce the application. Yeah. And members, I, I would like to, uh, I think it'd be appropriate to take a proposal to go into committee on this application. Uh, Councillor McGuire. Happy to propose if we go into committee, Chair. Councillor Thompson has his light on. Thank you, Councillors. All in agreement? Yep. Could you just give us a moment to get the...
Okay, members, so application number two is LA10 2021 Oh, sorry, we just want to update what was agreed in confidential business there. Kim? Okay, so during confidential business, members considered um, information in relation to planning application LA10 2021 1201F, and it was agreed that that application would be considered a convened planning committee meeting when uh, new information can be provided uh, to members in advance. Thank you, Kim. Um, moving on to application two, number two, it's LA 10 2021 Okay, members, so uh, paper B application number two, uh, LA 10 2021 So it was an outline application by Mr. Donaghy for a dwelling and domestic garage uh, on the Drumley Killy Road in Carrickmore. The recommendation is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report, uh, subject to the four reasons. Um, so, members, just before going into the details, the application is for a farm dwelling um, under CTY 10. Uh, the farm business is active and established, and no sites or development opportunities have been sold off, meeting the first two <laughs> criteria. The issue relates to criteria C, and that the site of the new dwelling is not visually linked or cited to a cluster with an established group of buildings on the farm, uh, as the buildings we cited are in third party ownership. Um, I'll come on to that in a second as well. The other issue then is the, the farm buildings then are not part of the applicant's farm. Uh, there's potential for noise and nuisance and odours on future residents uh, of the property and also the removal of the hedge along the frontage uh, and the development of the building would mar the distinction between the settlement and the surrounding countryside. Uh, the application has got previous planning history on it where the applicant made an application uh, under LA 10 2019-09490 uh, which was refused permission in October 19, uh, and the subsequent appeal was dismissed in July 2020. And those issues were broadly similar to the ones that are being raised today. Uh, and the Commission agreed with the Council's views uh, and dismissed the appeal. In terms of the application, then, members, the farm maps on the screen, and you can see the land then owned by the, the applicant or part of the farm map, sorry, the farm business. Application site then is the red rectangle with the yellow star in the middle of it. And the blue line then also shows additional land uh, in the control of the applicant. And you can see then the other buildings uh, nearby. So the buildings to the right-hand side of the application site and, and across the road are inside the settlement limit uh, of Carrickmore. And I'll come on to that in a second. That's an aerial photograph just looking down on top of the site. And you can see the yellow star then identifies the approximate position of where the, the dwelling would be constructed. And you can see the adjacent shed. Uh, and then there's a second shed has been built to the rear of that. Access then will come in via the existing laneway uh, and then run down almost to the front of the site before turning left into this field uh, and running down towards the, the development site. So the critical issue then is the, the distinction between the town and the country um, or the edge of the settlement there at Carrickmore. So on the screen then is the, the plan, the home area plan, which shows the settlement map and the black dot uh, dots are in the uh, the edge of the buildings uh, is the development limit. So everything inside there is inside Carrickmore. Everything outside of the black dots is in the countryside. And you can see our site up on the top left then with the yellow star. Uh, just zoomed in a bit further for members there. So you can see the site is identified just on the edge of the limit uh, adjacent to the farm buildings. So the views in these are Google Street View images members. So obviously they are at a, at a raised elevation, but they're very good in, in presenting a, 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 a the um, a visual appearance of the site. So as you come into Carrickmore, this is a view on the approach. So as you come along and then you move along, you come up to the 30 mile an hour speed signs. And then as you come closer, you can see the hedge and the verge on the left hand side. And then it's just immediately on your left end is the laneway and that's the access into the site. And that's looking down the laneway towards the, the farm building at the back with the development limit then running along the yellow line on the left hand side and the site then is identified on the screen. Coming out of Carrickmore, you can see then your well screen with the Landy Hedge and the laneway then and the edge of the limit in yellow with the site then 
uh, well screened by the trees. So the critical issue is the approach into Carrickmore. There's no issues about approaching out of Carrickmore. That's just another photograph. As I say, that's a raised photograph from the Google Street View image. So. In relation to the uh, reason for refusal, um, the site is beside farm buildings which are in the control and ownership of a third party. There is a lease between the applicant and the owner uh, for the long term use of them. Um, but as I say, that issue was raised before, although there's now no um, there's no opportunity to remove within a month notice, which there was um, raised in the previous lease. So the issue then is that this building is suitable for housing animals. And its proximity then to the applicant's site there's obviously implications for noise, nuisance, and odor. And you can see then the location of the building beside the the site. Uh, as the access members will use the existing laneway, as opposed to the previous application which had a new laneway. Now uh, there are alternatives available to the applicant, um, and those have not been discounted. Um, there are two areas, there are two groups of buildings on the farm. And you can see those within the yellow star uh, where there would be opportunity for new houses to uh, be cited and meet the various policies. So the recommendation then is to refuse permission uh, for the four reasons within the report. It's county to CTY 10 as it's not visually linked to cited cluster with an established group of buildings on the farm. It's county to 15 and that the development would have permitted more the distinction between the limit of Carrickmoor and the surrounding countryside and result in urban sprawl. And contrary to the SPPS, and that the occupants of any dwelling hereby permitted would be adversely affected by noise, odours, and general disturbance from the nearby farm group, which ought to be protected in the public interest. Uh, and then finally, the CTY one reason. Obviously, that would fall if members considered that the other three reasons were were not sustainable. Okay, thank you, Darren. So we have um, <laughs> in respect to the application, and uh, joined by Mr. Chris Cassidy. Uh, in support of the applicant. Um, so you're very welcome. Um, and you have 10 minutes uh, to, to speak to the committee in your own time. Thank you very much. Members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of this application today. The, the second question, as Darren said, was refused permission in 2020 by the Planned Appeal Commission. And that decision we studied closely with a view if could the concerns of the Commission be addressed under a new application. Uh, I believe they could, and that's why we submitted this application. Plan of permission will be granted where three criteria are met. The Council accepts criteria A has been met and the applicant's farm business has been uh, active and established for at least six years. It also accepts that no development opportunities have been sold off. In their decision, the Commission considered the agricultural sheds were not under the applicant's control, as he had only a 25-year lease on them, and either party could break that lease within, with a 12-month notice. To address this, the lease was extended, uh, with at least 40 years remaining unexpired. The lease cannot be terminated by either party. In essence, the applicant now owns the sheds for the length of term of the lease, and the new house will be clustered with these buildings. I'm happy for members to take legal advice on this from the Council of Solicitor, and uh, I'm fairly happy that they've confirmed that. Uh, this new lease addresses the planning appeal concerns, and this previous refusal reason has been overcome. Secondly, the Commissioner felt that the site would mar the distinction between the town and the countryside, as a new lane was proposed to run alongside the existing lane, and the infrastructure for that, uh, including any hedge removal required for it, uh, would mar the distinction between the, the town and the country. To address this, uh, we are proposing to use the existing access where no infrastructure is required, nor, nor will any hedging be removed. The existing fence will be relocated behind the existing, uh, the existing hedge, and the existing hedge only needs to be faced. As the photographs darn showed in, in the run up to it, you will see a, a very wide verge so there, there's nothing there that needs to come out. The commissioner accepted in their report that there are no views into the site, given the vegetation and topography. It is proposed to retain all this in situ. As this is in situ, the site is unseen from any, any public vantage point and cannot mar the distinction between the, the country and the settlement limit. Lastly, the house will be for a member of the farming community, who is well acquainted to living beside a farmyard. 
as the farm buildings are within the con are in their control, they can control the use of them. They've confirmed to me that they have no issue with living in close proximity to them, and it will not impact them on their residential amenity in terms of noise or odor. In my view, members, uh, we have addressed the concerns raised by the Plan Appeal Commission and have successfully addressed them. And I would ask members to reconsider the application. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cassidy. Well, within the time, and, and we do have an opportunity for members um, to ask any questions uh, to the agent here at this juncture. You had, can I just ask, uh, Mr. Cassidy, you had mentioned um, around leasing and ownership, and uh, maybe you suggested we would get advice on that. Can I just ask you to re just repeat that, maybe, and we possibly could do that at this point? Or thank uh, you. Of, of course, Councillor. Uh, the original application had a 25-year lease, and it had a 12-month break in it. And that's what the Plan Appeal Commissioner had a, an issue with, that there was a 12-month break that either party could break that. That was updated and it has now got a 40-year lease, which is unexpired. And there's no break clause. And any application, even a, for a, an ordinary application, when you sign the certificate, you're signing a Certificate A on ownership. And one of the, the bits in Certificate A to say, saying that you have ownership on it is, have you got 40 years unexpired on your lease? And if you've got 40 years unexpired in all intents and purposes, that's your buildings for 40 years. They're yours. Uh, and I'm more than happy that the, the council solicitor clarify that. That overcomes the, the issue the last time. Okay, um, thank you for, for clarifying that. Um... Would it be appropriate members to just ask Philip, he's on the, the call, maybe to make a comment at this juncture? Um, um, Chair, thank you. Uh, um, unfortunately, we, we may be finding ourselves in, in a position here where we have a number of applications which are coming before the committee where we're having to, um, we're having to maybe not be in a position whereby we can deal with them today. <laughs> um, my concern in relation to this is that uh, Mr. Cassidy's asking me to provide past comment in relation to a lease, which I haven't seen. Um, now, uh, you know, it may well be um, this is a reasonably straightforward matter. It may be a reasonably short lease. Um, if that was forwarded to me now, I would endeavour to take a look at it immediately, members. Um, but at the present time, I am not in a position to advise as to whether or not the lease would fall within the category that would meet the relevant terms of the planning permission. And apologies for that, members, but without having an opportunity to consider it, I just can't do that. I understand. I understand. Uh, Philip. Um... Okay, members. Well, I suppose one. I suppose one resolution would be to try and get the lease sent to Philip Kingston at this point. I don't know if that's possible, um, but it's worth maybe checking at this juncture and, and feeling that we would have to, we would have to defer. Sorry, Mister Cassidy. Uh, you wouldn't be able to. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have that lease submitted. Uh, Council has it. Yeah, we'll just give us a moment there. We'll just check if we have the file here. Just. <clears throat>
Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I think the issue of the lease and the definition of the lease is brought up by Mr. Cassidy as material. Um, I don't think a quick scan, no harm to uh, Philip now, is uh, appropriate because the material issue will actually go beyond just uh, what actually is the definition of the lease and the tenure of what that means for ownership or application. But it also actually extends into the planning policy with regard to can it then, those group, then be considered as part of the farm on the definition. So they're two connected, interconnected. They're, they're not separate, but they are, they are interconnected. But it's not necessarily if one passes, the other will fall, uh, in, in my humble opinion. So I think there's two points here. We need a thorough scan of the lease. And we also need then the officers to actually um, view that in conjunction with the policy uh, content in regard to farm buildings and what constitutes a farm building, because that will then become another or could become another group of farm buildings, possibly on the, the farm business. And then the policy context in regard to the application has to be taken into account. So I think no matter what we do, uh, we can't deal with it now, so it'll have to be deferred. And this is new information to a certain extent in regard to materiality. And I don't think it's an oversight on our officers. I think it's a nuance that uh, Mr. Cassidy you brought in now that needs to be dealt with. So I propose that we pers uh, defer for a month. Deferral for one month proposed. Uh, Councillor Robinson. And that. Okay. Uh, hopefully that allows time for that to be clarified. Um, are we all in agreement? <laughs> Councillor McGuire? Just for clarification, is this is this new information Mr. Cassidy has introduced at this stage? Uh, it's, it's not, Councillor. Uh, this here has been done from the very start of the application. Uh, I, I don't doubt what the agent's saying, but there's nothing on the file, so I'll have to look and see if it has been sent in and just hasn't been attached to the file, Councillor, to be honest. I don't know, but we don't have a copy here. Right, I was just clarifying that, so, yeah. so it's, it's it's just a grey area. We're not quite sure. That's OK. I'll allow that. Go around. OK. And uh, just for clarity, Mr Cassidy, we were still in the segment where we were discussing the matter with you, and that's why we, we <laughs> okay. take your, your comment there. OK. Thank just you. for clarity. Um, okay, members, well, are we all in agreement then that we can uh, defer for one month? Yeah. Agreed. Councillor McLaughlin, sorry. Yeah, it was just, if if it's clarified then that this is this is, is a, a farm and it's a farm building, uh, to a certain extent, is there a, like a, a yellow zone between what becomes country and what becomes town boundary? Because really, the Kite Moor Village will have no relevance if it's purely, purely a farm. Is, is that would that be the key to this, this whole thing? If, if you know, when we're looking at it, I know it's right on the edge, just outside the village. But if it's a farm building, does the village is it relevant? Because it was a farm a mile out the road, the village would have no relevance on it. Could I suggest maybe we? You raise those issues at the next meeting, guys, yeah. and I'm happy to go through those with you then. Okay, uh, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll, I'll include that in the presentation as well and make more information available to you. Guys, there, right? Sorry, just, just a question to Darren. Once we have sight of the legal opinion in regard to the lease and the implications that it has for the application, if this changes the situation, it's still on the delegated list. So you will then uh, form an opinion in regard to the information that's been provided by Philip. Yeah. Isn't that correct? It would need to be delegated back to officers. Yeah, that's right. Called yeah. In. Uh, yeah. So we would have to look at that again and, and see if you want to delegate it back to officers. Uh, to be honest, members, if it's coming back next month, it's as handy for me to update the report and bring it back to you next that's month okay. as it is to delegate yeah, it back fine. through yep. through everything. Happy with that. Sorry to, to be uh, bringing ambiguity in there again. Thank you. <laughs> Members, I would propose we take the next application and then take a comfort break if that's everyone's happy with that. Um, maybe, maybe it's just twenty-five to if you are content with that. 
So application three then is um, LA10 2021-0737F. And we do have speaking rights in respect to the application and um, we'll come to that in due course. So members application three then is LA10 2021-0737. It's a full application for a proposed replacement dwelling detached garage and general purpose shed slash stables for two horses. Uh, the applicant then is Mr Nugent. And the location then is on the Castle Roddy Road in Oma. The recommendation is to refuse permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to the five reasons. Uh, just to provide members with an update just before going to the report, uh, there's two issues, members, just to wish to bring to your attention. So an objection has been received from Nicola Brogan, MLA, uh, on the 9th of March. Uh, this objects to the application, stating the application lies within the area of outstanding natural beauty and does not satisfy many aspects of the policy. Contrary to CTY3, it's an old flax mill, not an old dwelling, and there's no evidence there was a dwelling. It does not meet CTY1 and does not demonstrate sympathetic integration with the surroundings. Uh, the letter supports residents in their objections and requests that the objects, objections are upheld. In relation to the NAA consultation members, they have replied on the 14th of March. Um, and forgive me, I'll just go through their comments because uh, they are important. So water, NAA Water Management Unit. I've advised that the proposal has the potential to adversely affect the surface water environment. Um, however, they then continue to say that, um, that uh, they suggest uh, the issues they've raised. Officers would suggest that conditions can be attached, uh, which will ensure there will not be an effect on the surface water environment. So forgive me if I made that complicated. So the, the one of the issues they raised is the storage of horse manure. And obviously a planning condition could be uh, attached to ensure it's not stored near to the water course. Um, the other issue then is a runoff to ensure that the uh, runoff from any waste does not go into the stream. Again, that could be conditioned. Um, and obviously best practice and mitigation then during construction will prevent pollution to the water course. So the issues raised by NAA Water Management Unit can be controlled by condition and there will be no adverse effect on the surface water environment. In terms of Natural Environment Division, they are content. Uh, they have said that the development is adjacent to a water course which is hydrologically linked to the River Foil and tributaries SAC and ASSI. Uh, given the distance to the foil and uh, provided best practice and pollution prevention measures are adhered to, then they are content the construction operational phases of the development will not have significant effect, sorry, not have a negative effect on designated sites. They have, however, asked for further information and raised concerns. Um, they've asked for a 10 metre buffer to the stream uh, for the septic tank. Uh, because it's not shown in the plans. Uh, again, that can be conditioned. The consent to discharge will also regulate the uh, discharge from the septic tank. They've asked for the retention of all trees with bat potential. Again, that can be conditioned. And they've asked for the retention of the old building. Again, that could be conditioned. So the uh, issues raised by NAA uh, can all be controlled by conditions. So there are no concerns there in relation to PPS2. So the application then, uh, as I say, it's for a replacement dwelling, garage and a general purpose shed. On the screen members then is the site location plan. And you can see the, the road then running along the left hand side of the site. And there's two houses nearby. If I zoom in a bit closer then members, just so you can see the Castle Raleigh Road uh, running along the front of the site. Access then coming in off the road and the new lane will, will be created then sweeping around into the rear of the site. The buildings then will be in the approximate position of the yellow star. And on the site location plan, you can see the agent has uh, coloured in a building in green and stated that that is the dwelling to be replaced. So the block plan then shows the access coming in off the Castle Roddy Road, as I say, the new lane we're then coming and sweeping round, and the house, the garage, and the shed at the back. So that's a photograph then looking into the site as works have commenced and the access and the laneway running in have been started and also work has started on the store which is in the back right hand side of the, the photograph as you can see. So the just go through the issues one by one. The proposal is for replacement dwelling so CTY3 applies and the applicant has referred to a building on the site uh, and that's annotated on their block plan as a ruin. So that's a photograph just of that building and you can see then that's looking in at the side elevation and uh, the gable. That's the internal view looking down on top of the, the building looking into it. 
And again, another slide just showing the condition of the building. This is a photograph then of the internal layout of the building and the internal condition. So you can see there are openings in uh, on the lower level and appears to be an upper level of the building at one stage. And then that's the photograph of the side gable and looking down the side of the water course down to the bottom corner where the work has commenced on the store. As a view then, members just looking back up from where the store is towards the building. And you can see it in behind the mobile home then. So the Industrial Heritage Records um, have included this uh, on their records and identify this as a flax mill site which would support the comments of the objectors that this wasn't a dwelling, it was a, a flax mill site. So just going back to the, the block plan, you can see then the location of the three buildings on site. And just annotated those onto the plan. So you can see the approximate position of the laneway coming in and the position of the three buildings on the site. So to gain access then you will have to remove the road frontage hedge. Uh, along the front of the site. Um, however, the visible lease plays can be provided and can be conditioned as part of any approval and forward site distance is achievable within the applicant's control and the public road. Coming around the back then, you can see then down the stone lane towards the, the ruin structure, which is uh, in the circle on the right. And then you have the three buildings. So the proposed dwellings, the yellow star, the garage in blue, and the stores, a red star. So that's a photograph then of works that have commenced on site. The house then will be sited uh, in front of that, uh, in the proximate position of that red uh, piece of machinery and the green canopy. And that's the uh, proposed elevations of the dwelling. So you can see the front elevation then will be facing up the slope and the two side elevations and then the rear elevation down towards the back of the site. Internal layout then shows a courtyard type building. And the garage then is a, a typical garage commonly found in the countryside with the store and shed then out the back uh, annotated as being for machinery storage with uh, two stables and an area of feed storage. So members, you look from the report then, the recommendation is to refuse uh, permission as there is no uh, building to replace which exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling. Uh, the second reason is, is in parallel with that in that uh, if it's not a dwelling, there is a building there, but it's a redundant non-residential building. And the replacements of that can be uh, permitted, provided it would demonstrate there are significant environmental benefits from its replacement and there are none being demonstrated. Uh, the reason three then is the new dwelling will have a sig visual impact significantly greater than the existing building. Four then is contrary to a number of policies as a design of the replacement dwelling is not of a high quality appropriate to its rural setting or respect the local distinctiveness within the spare and AONB. Uh, again, members, if it comes down to design, I would you know, suggest we could discuss that with the agent and, and see if that can be resolved um, if the other issues are overcome. Uh, and finally, then, number five is uh, contrary to the policies listed as it would have a significant adverse impact uh, upon the character of the location and wouldn't integrate into the landscape and Sperrin's AONB. Okay, members. Um, thank you, Darren. So as per the um, plan and policy, we have 10 minutes uh, for speakers in support of the application. Uh, and that would be Mr. David McKinley, the agent. Uh, we also have five minutes um, for those objecting to the application. Um, and we also then have five minutes for representation by Councillor Bert Wilson in support of the applicant. So first of all, uh, Mr. McKinney, you're very welcome. You're all very welcome. Um, and you have 10 minutes and I will flag up when you're approaching the nine minute mark. Uh, thank you, Chair and Committee for allowing me to speak on behalf of the, the applicant. Um, I take it you can hear me okay, yep. Are you fine, yep. Perfect. Uh, this application I think has been brought before the Council a little early. We were rating uh, we were awaiting a response from NAA following expenses ecology reports submitted. Uh, the NAA response is in now, it's literally in on Monday past. And, and as Starn pointed out, the response would appear to be relatively favourable, uh, subject to conditions and amendments. Uh, uh, in light of that, 
awaited response. I believe this application has not laid the surface to add additional information to support the application. Uh, the, the location of the access, the laneway was, was I, I was brought on this on the scene when this had all happened. Uh, and, and I asked why, and I said, well, it's really, I've got sheep, a couple of sheep, and I've got a couple of horses, and I've subdivided the, the plot up in such a way as to, as to, as to provide individual paddocks, and you would see that on my, my site plan. Um, Constantine Road Service are back, and as Darren rightly pointed out, we, we, can, we can provide the visibility displays within, within our ownership. Uh, point one, um, I've read through the planner's report this building has no roof, albeit it has all walls uh, and all are intact. It shows two floors. Uh, if Darren will go back to number 41, I think was the slide. Um, it shows two floors. You can clearly see, see pocket holes uh, sort of between the first floor and the ground floor windows. Uh, it has windows and door openings as, as would a house. Uh, my client uh, advises me or assured me there's a great grandfather and indeed, a Mr. McBride lived in that house for a time, uh, whilst he was waiting for a house to be built. Uh, the, the, this building is a was a dwelling at a time, and also in its life a flex mill. I, I I have noted that the first floor is it had a door in the gable. The, if you go back one slide, there's a door shown in the gable, and that would have been like a little sort of a walkway out onto the field. T to me, that would have demonstrated even first floor living whilst. Whilst uh, you can see the gable sort of wall just to the side of or in front of the black tarpaulin, um, would, uh, would have a ramp to the field. This would have been used for for, for living at, at a time. Um, what characterizes a dwelling? Uh, certainly the shape, it's a rectangular form. It's a pitch gables and very steep pitch gables, by the way. We have uh, vertical emphasized window openings. The only real thing missing is a chimney. And we've had a case before the committee one of mine, it was uh, Green Mound Road, uh, whereby it was accepted that not all dwellings would have a fireplace. And in this case, it could well have been stolen. It could have been a, a stone mullion or stone mantle in bits and pieces. But look, it's not unlikely that the Potbelly stove would have had a house of, of, of this nature. Uh, point number number two. Um, oh gosh, where did that go? Down? Point number two. Environmental benefits, my support and statement indicated that behind the strong hedgerow, the southern sort of boundary, the hedgerow uh, that protects the burn and indeed would partially hide the existing building, that area floods. Uh, to try to locate the dwelling within this area would have significant environmental issues in relation to, and as, and as NA pointed out, your septic tank, your soakaways and what have you. So suppose that by default, by locating the dwelling outside, we have we have an environmental benefit, uh, not forbidding if if the old dwelling was to be lived in. There's there's old there's old stone walls that really can't be insulated, uh, and we would try and retain that building as a store. So there's an environmental benefit by by not locating the dwelling in beside what's currently there. Uh, point three is always subjective. Uh, however, in this case, the proposal is, is basically a bungalow some five metres lower than the public road. It has been nestled into a hollow, and that's a good enough photograph. Go back to that last two there, if you don't mind. Uh, go back two, darn, please. There. Uh, there, that's perfect there. Uh, there are two secured boundaries. Basically, your your western boundary, you can see that, which is the, the photograph or the, the hedgerow just directly in front of you. And to your left hand side, you see a strong tree boundary. You have two secure boundaries. You have also landform, which is, as, as I said, the dwelling sits five meters lower than the road. Not all the hedgerow has been removed from the from the uh, sort of the, the, the visibility display requirement. And whatever is removed will be replaced uh, in regards to short term loss. Uh, so I, I, I believe I believe that that the dwelling completely integrates uh, by way of 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 the lower of the lower elevation and and the strong hedge. And it's quite evident there. Uh, the 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 uh, the stable and the garage has been positioned behind the dwelling uh, more by default than anything else. So the dwelling will hide everything uh, 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 from the public road. So basically, you're viewing. Down into the site from a public road, which, which, which should have never any issues. Point four again, subject to the design, and as Darren talked about, look, if the design's an issue, we can talk about that. Uh, 
I've I've driven through the listen uh, the Harvey Road, which is the road Castle Roddy Road comes off. There's a lot of modern houses built there. To be fair, isn't uh, and even the Castle Roddy Road for that matter uh, would have bigger concerns perhaps than that house, and they're constructed and built within the ANOB. Uh, we've not had the opportunity to discuss the design, but as Darren says, look, if we get that far, we can we can talk about that. Point five, um, we've already discussed the environmental benefits. We've, in, we've discussed the uh, the uh, integration uh, uh, big time. Uh, we believe this building completely, this application completely integrates. There will be a landscaping plan to address the NAA in regard to batteries and retention of trees and what have you. And we have shown planting on it to 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 help line the laneway in to subdivide the the plot into small small paddocks, um, uh, make it more attractive perhaps than what it originally was. Um, we're and as we say, we're not losing all roadside hedging. Um, to, there's two story houses coming to the site from the eastern. Uh, they're virtually on the edge of the road. Uh, on the western side, you've got a bungalow which sits directly beside. This was this was the applicant's aunt. Um, they're 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 allowed to overlook this dwelling by default. It just happens to be sitting in the hollow. Uh, so basically, the, the the dwelling proposes of similar scale size, similar sort of finishes as as. So, so the character is not destroyed. It's it's similar to what's already there. There's a pattern been formed, and this this adds to the pattern. That's all I have to say. Um, thank you for for listening to me. I'll take any questions. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. McKinney. Um, I'd invite members if they have any questions for the agent at this point. Councillor Irvine. David, how are you? Not too bad. Um, you've tried to uh, rebut some of the proposals, but uh, we still need a bit of significant evidence in regard to the design of the replacement dwelling not being appropriate mm -hmm. and the uh, laneway. Yeah. The 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 laneway in the first instance I'd mentioned at the very start it was to do with uh, it was to do with subdividing the plot up into small paddocks uh, and also that we could clearly get a a visible display both ways and if we checked that I can do that within the ownership of his land um, the laneway is isn't straight down and it curves the photographs clearly show that so it's not a a straight cut and decisive it sort of meanders through the field and goes down now that. Both laneways, whilst there's a fence either side of it, will have a will have a thorn hedge, uh, something to sort of break the whole thing up a little bit. In regards to the design, like th th there's there's a dwelling up on Listen, Listen Harvey Road, I think it is, literally 300 metres away, very modern bungalow. Um, to me, it's not unlike unlike what we have here. It's a, it's a twin. In this case, this is just a simple twin gabled fronted. Dwelling, which would be acceptable anywhere else, granted it's an A and O B, uh, but we can go back to the design. And as Darren says, if if we can overcome everything else, we can look at the design. But I haven't been asked or given the opportunity to look at the design. Uh, this has come on the back of uh, uh, I was waiting on the NEA response, to be quite frank, uh, and until that came back in, sort of this this whole thing's jumped the ship a little bit on me. If that makes sense. So if I had known there was issues with the design, I think to be fair, I would have taken a look at it. But that that opportunity hadn't happened. Thank you. Um, any other questions for the agent? While we have them, uh, Joe, Councillor Deacon. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, um, and uh, uh, thank you, Mr. McKinley, for your uh, contribution. Just in relation to. Um, uh, planning uh, being refused for reason two that the replacement of the redundant non-residential building would not bring significant environmental benefits and I think uh, you said in your presentation Mr McKinley that there would be uh, environmental benefits uh, and you mentioned using that old building as a store could you just expand on that a little please he has um he has uh, animals. Well, 
him and, and and the wife obviously have animals they have a couple of horses or one horse in particular we're thinking of expanding to two whilst that's catered for down in the uh d down in the large shade he also has sheep and, and and he would have maybe utilized a small room and just let animals rattle in and out of the ground floor uh the kids would have used the maybe the first floor in it as a when we tidy it up uh, as, as a sort of a playroom um i suppose uh, environmentally what, what do you what do you uh limit on money what do you spend to to, to help bring that building back into some form of of a, of a dwelling again you, you have a lot of insulation there's there's heat loss there's there's so many non-environmental issues with the dwelling that would uh would sort of drive you away from it but in any case the intended use would be a domestic store and it would keep a little bit of animal feed for 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 uh for for the sheep um but the biggest benefit uh, and it really is a benefit is is moving from behind that hedge to in front of the hedge uh, and getting away from the getting away from the river getting away from the burn uh, and the protection of that burn and, and it does have an environmental impact on on the dwelling in regards to anything that would spill uh, a septic tank or 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 soak away so runoff or a car leak in a car leak in a, a maybe a little bit of engine oil all that stuff would have an environmental impact uh to, to to having it w where it is so that that all can be controlled much easier on 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 sort of where we proposed it in the natural hollow and and protect the water away from that thank you chair thank you thanks sir thompson <clears throat> hey chair uh just a quick query for david uh you did say in your remarks there david you have come in uh or this has been brought in quicker than you'd have liked can you just clarify the position with regard to that, and when have you been brought into this process? Thank you. I was uh, notified not that long ago that this was going to happen within a week and a half that this was going to council as a refusal. I, I was watching the portal, and, and the applicant was also watching the portal just to see the response back from NAA, because we knew with the work, or I knew with the work that he'd done down below, there'd be maybe issues, and there would be bonding, and, and there would be... Uh, mitigation measures to put in place and and un, until i got that response back we weren't in a position to to reply now i expected i expected i suppose i expected the application to sit there until till that come back and as i say that only come back on monday so it's, it's, it's jumped my gun a little bit if that makes sense uh and and at that point when we were working through the nea comments we could i could address the issues of of design and uh and and any other further further comments that the planning service would have had. So that when I say I jumped the gun, that's that's exactly why why uh, I felt that we're approximately a month too early here. Okay, thank you, David, for the clarification. Thank you, Chair. Team members, no further any further questions. While we have the agent here. Nobody is indicating, so sorry, Councillor McLarry. Sorry, David, you've, you've only, as you've indicated, you haven't maybe been involved in that side as much. Is there, is there any evidence of the of a mill race or anything like that, any of the ancillaries that would have went along with the mill? I mean, uh, the, is there a possibility that they could possibly go something hydro into that but restored building if the suitable planning permission was applied? The, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, actually, and that's the thing I'd hate discussed when I was asked to cite, and to be fair, I was asked to cite the lanes, the hole was dug and everything. I, I, I didn't know what to say to the man, and he said, well, look, I've, I've forethought this whole thing. Uh, there is an old race that can be reopened again. Uh, the, the land to the east of the old ruined house is saturated in water. Uh, there was the burn, and there was a race that come down through the field. Now, he owns the race. Uh, or he and she owns the race. So yes, there was talk of, of perhaps uh, uh, yes, it's a water wheel, and he would it would done it would done something to that nature, generate a little bit of electricity. You're absolutely right. But the race is there in parts. It needs to be reopened and it needs to be cleaned out. So there was an old race there, uh, and yes, it can be brought back into the equation. It's subject to planning. Yep, absolutely. And thank you for raising that. I overlooked that. One. Okay. Members, any further questions at this point? <clears throat> and if not, then I thank Mr. Um, 
I thank, sorry, Mr. McKinley, uh, who I know, I thank you for your time. And uh, I now invite um, our next part of the protocol facilitates the objections. Uh, and we have five minutes allocated to this uh, part of the meeting. And I, I welcome Mr. Owen Devere, I hope I pronounce your name okay, to the meeting. And I will, Mr. Uh, so the very, I will uh, highlight when we're approaching about four minutes, just to keep uh, okay. the five minutes. So go ahead in your own time. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, Chair, committee members and council officials, many thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I represent a number of local residents in the community of Tycar and Dunmullen. Our contribution will be very brief as the local authority planning team have clearly set out how the application fails to meet the most basic criteria of PPS 21. The applicant, Mr. Lee Nugent, has applied to replace a dwelling which, in uh, the, uh, the opinion of, of planners and local residents, does not exist. Mr. Nugent started on the site well in advance of uh, the submission. The driveway, fencing, reduction in levels, stockpiling, the riding arena, the footings, and the slab for the stable block are all partially complete. The site is uh, located in an area of outstanding natural beauty, which must raise the bar for any application. Planners have stated five fundamental reasons for refusal, as has been discussed already here today. Um, number one, there is no building to replace which exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling. Now, um, if there is an argument, as uh, stated by David there, then uh, I, that hasn't been documented in any way, and we haven't seen any evidence which has been uh, submitted to the local authority. So we're, uh, um, basically any argument that it is a dwelling that's just been uh, presented here today in uh, just an offhand manner. Um, number two, the replacement of, of the redundant non-residential building on the site would not bring significant, significant environmental benefits. We would request, uh, um, just on this point, since uh, the conversations have been happening here today, just for the uh, planner to clarify just exactly what that means. My understanding is that if the old building that is there is leaking or is having some kind of negative impact on the local environment, that's really what that um, policy is about. But if a uh, Darren could clarify, that would be great. Um, number three, uh, the new dwelling would have a visual impact significantly greater than the existing building. Now, hey, um, most residents of the area are actually not aware that this building exists. This um, Flax mill, because it is uh, just located so far down, you can't actually see it from the road. So no matter what is actually put on that site, unless it's invisible, then it will have a visual impact significantly greater than the existing building. Number four uh, refers to the uh, design of the dwelling, which has been discussed already. Um, number five, the proposed laneway, and again, that's been discussed but it does um, basically cut right through the field and the, the pictures from the planning officers there did I could demonstrate what's what's happening there. Um, the planning team have expanded on these reasons uh, better than we could and we do believe that the committee can trust in their judgment and their expertise on uh, these matters. Planners have not requested additional information as the principle of development is fundamentally flawed. So uh, we would urge members not to defer and just to refuse the application uh, this afternoon. Our community is deeply concerned about Mr. Nugent's application and his plans for the site. We, we all feel privileged to live in such a beautiful area with a young and vibrant community based around our local primary schools. Many thanks for your kind attention. Okay, thank you, Mr. Deveri, uh, for speaking to the committee. Um, 
there's an opportunity maybe for anyone who wants to ask a question uh, to this juncture. <coughs> And nobody is indicating, so would, I would thank uh, Mr. DeVere for his contribution. And uh, moving on then to councillor's uh, representation, and I invite councillor Bert Wilson, who wants to speak in support of the applicant. So you're very welcome, councillor Wilson. You, you have five yeah. minutes. And, yeah, Chair, uh, can you hear me all right? I can hear you, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's Please, fine, thank you. Thank you. Yes, well, I'm like uh, the uh, agent because I hadn't much time, but I always like to see something before I uh, can debate it. And I visited the site yesterday. Uh, looking down from the roadside, from the roadway, it's really, as the photographs or the montages showed there, a really steep uh, field. And uh, the dwelling uh, that, or whatever it is that exists, is really at the bottom along the brew of the, the stream that is there. Now, going down and looking at that, the, uh, to me, whoever built it uh, and when they built it is a long time ago, but as well, the, the walls are intact and very well, very straight, very well built. The only thing that's missing on that is a roof. But looking at it, it's quite possible that at one stage uh, there was uh, maybe something to do with a flax mill underneath and possibly a dwelling on top. Uh, that is very well below the, the road. The proposed uh, dwelling that is to be built there will be a single story and uh, whether it's a five and a half or six and a half, I'm not sure, but it would uh, the ridge top of it would be well below the road, uh, in my opinion, and as definitely it would be, uh, it would be at the very bottom of the field as well, and uh, it would be out. Of, it has to be moved there to get out of the floodplain to start with, as well as that, it it would be screened with a fairly mature backdrop of trees, and it would be almost invisible invisible from the road, uh, as the roof, as I say, will be well below the uh, road level. Uh, as all the dwellings in that area to me are mainly single story bungalows and the type of this, uh, maybe with some change or alterations to the design, it would fit very well into the local area and uh, house design that is already there. Uh, it, uh, and, and, and viewing the building as it is, it's difficult to uh, make out whether somebody, nobody can say that nobody that there wasn't a person lived in it, as I believe there could be uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, say someone to do with a flax mill under it and, and a dwelling on the top of it. But uh, the, um, the the environmental benefits to me would be that it would tidy that area up, which it does need to be, and uh, it would nestle into the existing trees in the, the area, and uh, it would uh, really uh, tidy it up. But uh, I believe that it uh, probably was lived in at a stage. I, nobody can say it was or it wasn't, to be 100% sure. It, uh, it was obviously sitting on the bank of that stream. And at this minute in time, uh, to move it out to where uh, the proposal is, would be of benefit. A single story new dwelling of whatever design would make a, a big difference to the area in environmental benefits, in my opinion. And uh, really, it is, uh, I couldn't believe that uh, such a well built uh, stone, uh, whatever you want to call it, house, dwelling, whatever. Uh, is is done there, and uh, it doesn't very well. Even on the pictures that you've seen there, it doesn't even uh, really uh, give it uh, the full benefit as what is on the ground. And uh, I was glad I went to see it because you can't argue a point if you don't see it. And that uh, chair would be my opinion, and I could not uh, say that it wasn't. A, 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 I couldn't honestly. A, speak or say that nobody ever lived in it because it's quite possible that uh, in past years that somebody did live in that and uh, it, it, it's quite uh, it's quite sound walls other than the roofs missing. Thank you. Thank you councillor and within the time 
Uh, so at this point, I ask um, our planning officer, does wish to make any comments? Just to just to clarify a few things, I remember. So I'll just go through the reasons for refusal and uh, to make sure um, that there's no confusion over the issues that are being raised. So the, essentially, the question uh, under refusal reason one um, that you have to decide upon is: Well, the building that's there, the structure that was there. I'll call it a building, just for ease of reference. So the building that was there um, is going to be replaced. Uh, you can replace an old dwelling in the countryside, where the building to be replaced exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling. So the question for you today is, does that old building exhibit the essential characteristics of a dwelling? And if it does, then you can replace it. If it doesn't exhibit the essential characteristics of a dwelling, you can then have a second opportunity under the replacement of a redundant non-residential building. Uh, so you can replace, for example, if it was a flax mill, you could replace it as a redundant non-residential building. You can replace that with a new house, but you can do only do that where the redevelopment would bring significant environmental benefits. And as the objectors uh, representative has, has quite rightly said, that's a replacement of an old building that is currently ha causing a harm to the environment, and you're replacing it with a new building and offsetting the harm or negating the harm or mitigating the harm. So you would have to show that the old building that's there is causing a nuisance, a harm to the environment, and you're going to replace it with a new building, which will solve the problem. It's not that um, the old building can't be renovated, repaired, or anything to do with that. It's purely and simply, what effect is that old building having on the environment that you can fix? In respect of the other issues, so part three then, the new building will have a, uh, new dwelling will have a visual impact significantly greater than the existing dwelling. Um, the off-site replacement was raised by the agent um, and officers would be content that that sole issue is acceptable. You could not require somebody to replace the building in situ. It's down beside the water, it'd be wholly unreasonable to do that. The question then is, the location of the new site, will that building have a visual impact significantly greater than the existing building? And uh, the answer to that is yes, and that's compounded by the fact that the design of the house is inappropriate for the area of outstanding natural beauty and wouldn't integrate sitting in the middle of the field. So those are the various issues related to that. Uh, and also, as I say, the um, the reason for fusel number five relates to the laneway coming in, just goes through the middle of the field. It's a sweeping suburban driveway, uh, which is what we don't do, never mind. Uh, we don't encourage it in the air when B, which has a high, a high standard of design distinctiveness. Councillor Dehan. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Darren, for those clarifications. I just really wanted to uh, focus on the design of the replacement building. And in your in Darren's report, Chair, he said that this is not of a high quality appropriate to its rural setting or respect the local distinctiveness within the Sparrows. And yet, uh, Mr. McKinley and Councillor Wilson, in their presentations, uh, did highlight the fact that uh, in that area, there are a number of buildings which are of a bungalow type, and that this proposed dwelling uh, is not out of keeping with that. Uh, and also, the agent did imply that they could work on uh, the, the design of the building. So I just really wanted to clarify with Darren, uh, you know, in terms of the design of the replacement dwelling, um, uh, can we work on the design of the building so that it would be appropriate to its setting? And also, uh, can we work on the laneway so that it would be more appropriate uh, to the setting? Thank you. Yeah, so in terms of the design members, that's the... The design of the building on the screen um, and to be honest it's not uh, a, a design that would be typically found in the AONB. Um, it is approved elsewhere outside of the Sperns area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, however there are a number of issues uh, that could be improved. The length of it is significant length. It's got the two large gables from projections and things. Internally then you're looking at a rectangular form with extensions coming off it. So there are a number of, of fundamental design issues. However uh, if that is the sole issue uh, I'm sure that between myself and the agent we could uh, discuss that uh, and resolve that. Um, uh, that has been done in the past on other applications. However, I would stress that that's not just the sole reason and that will not overcome all of the other issues uh, that are before us today. Okay, and Councillor McLaughlin. Right, Darren, there doesn't seem to be any evidence, nobody has 
put forward any evidence of any type of contaminants from the, the uh, linen mill. Now, I'm not old enough to remember it, and Councillor Wilson didn't indicate that he was old enough to remember it either. And, and if he doesn't remember it, then there's no chance of me. But uh, I, I have a uh, bit of the farm was used used for, for ratching, I think it was used for. Uh, and it's, it's a big, long track. And that piece of the farm is, is contaminated. It, 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 it's continue, it, if, you, if you break the soil or, or the surface of it, it, it stinks. <laughs> it still stinks. And, mm. and apparently that's to do with the linen trade. So in around that building, is there any reports to indicate that, that there is contaminants coming from that building or it has caused contamination to the area? Because, I mean, I don't know, it's not in my lifetime was there any linen growing on our farm and I'm in my 50s and, and I'm sure, I know it was during the wartime they had to grow a certain amount, but after that, I don't know how long they grew it after that, but it did contaminate. There hasn't been any evidence presented of that or... There's no indication of any reports having that in it. Uh, straightforward answer, I'd answer no, there's nothing. Uh, there's no information on it. Uh, I know the agent has mentioned how sort of suggested planners jump the gun by putting this on and going forward with the refusal. Um, personally, I would see the application not being front loaded rather than jumping the gun. Uh, so if an application is coming in, they need to demonstrate this information and show the council this. Um, there is no evidence of any environmental benefits. When I walked the site at the very start, uh, you can clearly see around the site, that, you know, the, the vegetation and all is healthy. There's no evidence of any, uh, the vegetation being brown or any discolouring of any land or anything like that at all. There's no smells, there's no media issues. Uh, so I wasn't able to identify any significant environmental uh, facts of this building. It just appears to be the old remnants of the building sitting there in the landscape beside the waterway. Okay, thank you, Darren. Councillor Gardy. Thank you, Chair. And we'll call the council. Planning officers competent, maybe that's what it referred to as Darren. Um, no, just Councillor Dean, I think referred to um the lane, Darren. I don't maybe know if you got to answer or not. I think by judgment it's all mowed out there already. I think uh, Josephine asked, is there anything we could do to help that or is, is the damage done, I suppose, just regarding the lane issue? Yeah, I'll just go back just to show members the photograph. So that's oh, the one up above. So that's the proposed plan. So you can see Catch up. There we go. So the on the screen then you can see the block plan shows the access coming in off the road, and the agent has said he put it there really to allow the visible lease place to be provided uh, within their control and their ownership. Uh, as I say, unfortunately the access just purely comes in, in the middle of the field. Uh, it's it's everything that a planning officer would say to people not to do. From um, you know you meant to go along the side of a site boundary. Uh, or go along an existing sort of area where you could nestle in beside the landscape. This one comes in through the middle of the field and then sweeps round. Uh, it does follow the contours to a degree, but I'm sure you can see from the photographs, you know, this is the area of outstanding natural beauty. So you're going to come around the corner and see a very suburban looking laneway uh, sweeping through the middle of a field um, with new landscaping up and down either side of it. So it's everything that planning officers would suggest not to do and not encourage people. Um, however, I'm sure if that was the sole issue, much like the design, uh, members, we could go back to the agent and look about amending that and getting that resolved. But as I say, just with the bigger issues that are at play here, uh, that wasn't that wasn't pursued. Councillor Dehan. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I have uh, uh, listened very attentively uh, to the presentation of this planning application and all uh, the various viewpoints that we have been given, uh, both uh, from the agent and Councillor Wilson, and also from the objectors. So, uh, Chair, if I could just go, go uh, individually address uh, the uh, item eight, the recommendation for refusal. The first point is that uh, there is no building to replace which exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling. Uh, now, we have seen photographs of the dwelling. Uh, the applicant does not deny that this is an old flax mill. And in fact, the agent even states that, you know, there is a mill race there which could be cleaned out and restored and which would uh, improve uh, the environment there. Uh, 
Uh, but they're, they're, to me, I mean, I hear the applicant when he said that he has evidence that a Mr McBride actually inhabited that building. Um, so, and, and we looked at the openings uh, in the building and um, that would perhaps suggest to me uh, that it was suitable at least for human habitation. Um, so I, I do feel that, you know, um, there, there, there is uh, evidence that this building has been used uh, as a dwelling. Um, in relation to the fact that the uh, replacement uh, would not bring significant environmental benefits, um, well, the agent in his presentation to us uh, uh, did highlight uh, the environmental benefits that a replacement dwelling would have, particularly given the proximity uh, to the watercourse um, and uh, any uh, uh, negating any potential contamination of the watercourse by the present siting of the replacement building. And then also plans to um, uh, restore uh, the old building so that it could be used for uh, storage purposes. Um, in relation to the third point, uh, that the dwelling would have a visual impact, we have heard that the proposed site of this dwelling uh, is uh, will be located in a hollow. Uh, that it is, uh, you know, the, it's a single story dwelling and that um, we have heard evidence that uh, it probably would not impact greatly in terms of massing effect or being uh, uh, visible from the road and that uh, uh, planting uh, uh, could really uh, shield the, the building further. Uh, in relation to the replacement dwelling not being of a high quality or in terms of its design aspect, mm. I would accept that uh, and I accept the opinion of uh, the planning officer that that is the case. But the agent has expressed himself willing to look at the design of the building and to make it more uh, acceptable to its location within an area of outstanding natural beauty. And then in terms of the laneway, if I recall correctly, uh, Mr. McKinley did say uh, that the laneway would uh, divide the land into two paddocks and also that there would be planting along it. But again, uh, the planning officer has stated that providing other objections could be dealt with, that uh, there could be found a way around uh, the, the, the form of the laneway. Um, so having regard to all of that, Chair, um, uh, I feel content that uh, uh, this um, application uh, does meet planning policy and hence I would recommend that we uh, do not accept the planning officer's recommendation for refusal, but rather that we should recommend it for approval. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, Member, just uh, I'm very conscious there are, there, are, there are objections to the application uh, and I want to make sure that we cover all of the issues uh, when we do make a, a decision on the application. So Member uh, has put forward their opinion. Uh, just under the first issue um, about the no building to replace which exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling uh, and you've gone through that and commented on that. Um, however, within those comments, Member, you, you sort of said about how it was used as a dwelling. Um, just to be clear that the policy test is not whether it was used as a dwelling, but it's whether it, today it exhibits the essential characteristics of a dwelling. So if the member wants to maybe just explore that issue about how it exhibits the essential characteristics today, so from the photographs that have been put forward to you. Yes, well, the agent did reference uh, uh, the openings in the walls and the uh, height of the gables and uh, the, the um, structure of the building. And he felt uh, uh, very confident that it could have been used as a dwelling. Um, he referred to the fact that there was no chimney in the dwelling, but uh, did reference a case whereby uh, a previous planning application was approved where there was no chimney on uh, an old building, but that uh, he thought perhaps uh, the building could have accommodated a stove. Um, 
So uh, just looking at the photographs, I'm content that it definitely uh, could have been, uh, it did, does exhibit the features of a dwelling and could have been used for that purpose. Just in relation to that then, obviously members, if you consider that it, it does exhibit the essential characteristics of a dwelling, then it was a dwelling. So we don't need to worry about that second policy test about replacement of non-residential and uh, redundant buildings. So this application would be based uh, on uh, the replacement of an old dwelling. So just to clarify that. Yes, that would be my understanding, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Irving. Well, I think the, the input from Councillor Deacon, un, unfortunately, I take a contrary view. Um, there, there are fundamental problems within this application, and I think some of them have actually been indirectly alluded to by the agent. Um, we haven't properly addressed the majority of the reasons for uh, refusal. Uh, all we've got is actually verbal information coming forward from Mr. McKinley. And that can be stated as comment. It's not evident. We haven't actually seen it provided to our planning officers for them to scrutinise. Uh, this is the type of application that we've dealt with infrequently uh, before. And uh, my comment would be to the agent on behalf of the applicant, they should consider withdrawing and reapplying and properly addressing the reasons for refusal as noted on the recommendation. Um, the issue with regard to the laneway is a fundamental one, um, should be looked at. The issue with regard to the design of the building within Asperance AONB is a fundamental one. And it's not just looking at it, it's a fundamental redesign and possibly repositioning. And that is not something that should be done within an application uh, like this. It should be taken away and reapplied. The issue in regard to the building, um, we haven't, or I haven't, in my opinion, received enough evidence to provide that it was a dwelling. I have heard it referred to as a redundant flax mill. I've heard it referred to that somebody did live in it several years ago. And you can see the pocket holes where it was two story. It has been noted that there is a disused water course running by, um, which is um, reminiscent of some sort of mill race or, or working. So um, my advice to the agent on behalf of the applicant would be to consider withdrawal and resubmitting, front loading all the necessary information uh, especially uh, with regard to mitigation in regard to the laneway that has been put in without approval, um, that a laneway that meets the site line requirements but would have to be redressed to possibly meet the requirements of a site in the countryside in the Sparrows AONB. So I cannot support um, Councillor Deacon's uh, recommendation. I would be voting against it. But I would recommend to the agent that he considers withdrawing this application and reapplying with all the necessary information. That's something we can't do, but uh, that would be in my advice to him. Thank you, Chair. Okay, members. Um Councillor McLaughlin. Yeah, um, I would tend to agree with Councillor Irvin. There's a lot of this. This is what is referred to as an area of outstanding beauty, and and we have to be extremely careful. And and I think that Councillor Irvin has touched upon. I think maybe if this was deferred for a month, and that the uh, Councillor Irving has made some suggestions, and if the agent has heard those, then maybe he could speak to the applicant and they could take certain courses of action. But if we give them a month to, to think about that and then come back, but at the moment, I wouldn't be happy to let, to I wouldn't be voting for this project at this particular moment in time. I'd be agreeing with the officers that we uh, don't recommend the planning permission. 
Councillor Irving. <clears throat> yes, I'm ha happy to second that proposal again. Uh, I don't think a reworking of what's currently on site will do anything. I think this is basically, and it's not a mechanism I like, I will uh, readily admit it. It's a mechanism for the agent to actually advise the applicant to reconsider the whole thing and withdraw it and reapply. But the, the um, mechanism we have is defer, um, but I, I'm not in favour of it fundamentally. Thank you. Okay, members, <clears throat> we have a proposal by Councillor McClary, seconded by Councillor Irvine, uh, to defer the application for one month uh, to allow consideration of um, Councillor Irvine the points that he had made in respect to the application. Is members in agreement with that? Okay, uh, we're not in agreement then. Councillor Gerardy? Neither, uh, it's not a question, it's more a comment. It's very difficult to not support a deferral when we've been doing it all day to date on, mm -hmm. on this operation, but it is regrettable after we have discussed it at length. Councillor Dehan um, made her, her valid proposal as far as she's concerned, and uh, the gentleman behind. I think that perhaps ticks both boxes because uh, Councillor Dean was concerned about issues regarding design and the lane and one thing or another. But this is really regrettable that we have done this with every application. And you know, whereas none of us are happy to do it, I think um, th that is the position that that we are, we find ourselves in. I just hope after the recess now that we. The next determination would we at least make a determination on it somewhere though and um, that would be a, a, a goal of mine perhaps suddenly after the toilet break thank you Chair. so i'm just going to bring paul in here a second members all i was going to say like if the proposal is to allow the agent some time to consider withdrawing the application then look if if you obviously have concerns with the proposal and you uh, make a determination to agree with the officer's concerns and the recommendations is before you. There'll be a, a period of time after this where the application will be held pending a call in. And so that'll give the agent an opportunity to consider whether he wants to withdraw the application and then resubmit again, um, rather than deferring for a full month. Okay, Councillor Irving. <clears throat> Sorry, playing ball here. It's a right handed mouse. Yeah, technically, sorry, I'm just trying to clarify with Paul. If we determine the application now, <clears throat> that is a decision that will stand. It will be subject, uh, obviously, under the Heartland Protocol to be actually called in by a member of the council. But all that will do is actually then, I presume, bring it back to this committee for reconsideration. It is not actually um, dealing with the, in my opinion, dealing with the issues at hand, which in my opinion, again, I'm saying my opinion, we have three fundamental issues that are not properly dealt with uh, this afternoon and cannot be properly dealt with until sufficient information is provided and dealt with and talked about by our officers. So uh, I appreciate your point, Paul, but I don't think it would deal with uh, what I want dealt with. So uh, I would not be happy with that approach. And I will stand with uh, a deferral uh, that I've seconded unless the proposal withdraws that deferral for a month. Thank you. I'm going to take one more speaker and then we're going to have to make a decision because we have a proposal and a seconded and uh, I'm conscious of that. Councillor Deacon. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, I just want to uh, uh, remind the committee chair that our planning officer uh, did advise us uh, that the design of the replacement dwelling uh, could be worked on with the agent and also that the uh, design of the laneway could be worked on uh, with the agent and also that if we accept uh, the first point that this uh, uh, building 
displays the characteristics of a dwelling uh, that uh, uh, point two would fall. Um, um, I believe that the uh, applicant and uh, uh, supporting councillor have made the point uh, regarding the visual impact uh, uh, of, of, of the new dwelling. Um, and uh, I, I'm happy to accept the officer's advice that we can work on the design aspects. So, Chair, I, I would, uh, I, I would uh, reiterate my proposal, Chair. Thank you. Members, um, Councillor Freed, do you want to make a quick comment? Because I'm going to put this to the vote. Um, just a quick comment. Thanks, Chair, and I'm going to be brief. Cause, and the first thing, Chair, sorry, I, I have to leave at half four. It's a family thing and I can't get out. I don't like leaving. I know it's not to do with where the meeting's gone today. No, funny, I'd agree with Josephine. I had a second Josephine proposal as well. If, uh, and I have to leave, I'll have to back out today. Sorry about that. Okay. Thanks, Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, given what Councillor Dehan has said there with regard to uh, issue four and five, uh, is the officer prepared to say to us that uh, issue four and five, uh, that we can effectively ignore them because he is satisfied that after this meeting that there can be a resolution to item four and five? Is that Would that be accurate? Because I have some difficulty with this application myself. So in terms of uh, any discussions, if there is a deferral, any discussions with the agent will be about what they're willing to change and what they're willing to amend, and we can guide them on that. Um, there have been a couple of examples previously where we've been successful in that they've come forward with good suggestions that have met the policy, uh, and therefore those can be agreed. But if the applicant or agent isn't willing to bring those forward and wants to stick with the design that's before you, then obviously you know, you'll st you'll still be refusing the application. You know, so it's the willingness of the applicant and agent to come forward with amendments. <coughs> Experience to date is that the agent has done that, and I'm sure we can we can work with them on this and resolve the issues on those two sole points only. Um, but I would remind you the other issues then officers would still have significant concerns about one and two. Yeah, I have concerns myself. Chair, uh, as I say, we've often adjudicated on whether a building or a ruin was uh, adequate to be described as a, a dwelling in the past, but... Uh, in this application, it has been supported by objectors as well, and I think maybe that's unique in this case. So I have difficulty with it, especially with it being in the AO and B in the Sparrows. So uh, I'd be supportive of a deferral, perhaps, Chair. Yeah. Sir Thompson. Very quickly, Chair, and it's been a long debate. Uh, I don't think there's any question mark about the agent uh, bringing in uh, the necessarily amend amendments. On this issue, but however, uh, on this occasion, I am prepared to support uh, Councillor Irvine's proposal uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Key okay, members, um, it's my understanding we have two proposals. I that was seconded first and not proposed first. Okay, Councillor Irvine's proposal has been proposed and seconded first um, for a deferral. And are we all, is all the members in agreement? So for the benefit of the tape, just keep your hands up there. Uh, members in agreement are Councillor McGuire, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Thompson, Councillor Irvine, Councillor Coyle, Councillor McLaurie, Councillor Rainey. And those against? Those against the feral are Councillor Campbell, Councillor Feely, Councillor Garrity, and Councillor Deacon. That vote, that is carried. I last uh, Darren to sum up. Oh yeah. Sorry, just to clarify, was that that was for one month the deferral? It was yeah? yeah, it was for one um, month. So just in relation to that, members, um, the month deferral will allow the council planning officers to negotiate and discuss with the applicant and the agent. If amendments come in, those will have to be re-advertised and renewed and notified. So it will not be brought back next month, but we will certainly give the agent one month to come up with amendments. 
uh, and then bring it back to you as soon as possible. Okay. Team members, <coughs> thank you. Members, we go now to application. Sorry, uh, I did say we'd have a comfort break at this juncture. I believe I nearly forgot there. Um, so we'll have a 15 minutes, Councillor Irvine, Councillor uh, Robinson. Uh, 15 minutes. Break. 15 minutes, I think. I got five, too.
Really given the late start and, and the recess. Um, so um, just, just to make that known to the committee. Um, so we're moving on now to application number five. That's LA 10 2021 I'm going to ask Darren just to introduce that application. Okay, members. So uh, number five then uh, on paper B is LA 10 2021 1259. It's an outline application for a dwelling on a gap site for Mr. Donnelly. And the location then is in Corley Road, uh, Corbley and Dremore. The recommendation is to refuse planning permission for the reasons listed within the report and subject to two reasons. I'll just take you through the details then on the screen. Remember, you can see the site location plan. And the site then is identified in red as a red rectangle with the additional lands then within the control of the applicant outlined in blue. And you'll note there's an annotation on the drawing uh, over on the right hand side, which states the approved site for dwelling K 2007 1507 slash RM. And there's an arrow then leading over to an area which is beside our application site. So just if I take another aerial photograph, just to, to ordinance survey map, sorry, to see where we are. This is the, the surrounding property. So you can see number 60, the, the top left, our application site in red with the yellow star. Uh, and then number 56 uh, is where the annotation refers to on the site location plan about the approved site. Opposite the site, you have number 59, an old farmhouse, uh, and then 61 up to the top left. So just taking the aerial photograph, so you can see, uh, just numbered them one, two, and three in this side of the road, obviously, as a, a dwelling and a gap site, um, as an infill opportunity, the, this side of the road is important. So number one, then, is the dwelling and garage fronting onto the public road. Number two is our application site, which is the red line around the, more or less the whole field and the laneway. And there are two buildings on that site. And then number three is the approved site, uh, K07-1507. So critical views. So if you look in the top left, you see the star. Uh, if you imagine you're standing there in the road and you're looking towards the application site beside the existing dwelling, so that's the view you would have there. So that's house number one on the right-hand side. And the site then is behind the flag and those buildings. If you move on up the road to the junction of the laneway and you imagine you're looking down the road and uh, the site then is on the right hand side so you're beside those old buildings that's the view there you see so that's the old building site beside the road uh, our site is in to the right and the old vacant farmhouse is on the left hand side across the road so then if we go further up just roughly in the middle of the site and turn around and look back on ourselves at those two buildings you can see that's the photograph there of the two of them so it's the two buildings that are on the site. Next, then, if we go further on up the road and you're um, roughly in front of the application or the adjacent site, so that's plot three, and you're standing in the yellow star looking back towards the application site, that's the view you have there. So uh, the approved site is into the left behind the gate there with the hedge then the boundary to the next field, and our application site is in behind all those trees uh, and the, um, the conifers at the front. So this is a view then finally of the site frontage um, when you're standing at the approved site looking in towards the site three and that's what you can see. So the, um, the field is uh, rough grazing at the moment. However, from the aerial photographs, members, you can see the outline of the shape of a house. So uh, it is assumed that the previous approval that was in there was dug out and was commenced. Um, however, there's no certificate of lawfulness for that or anything, but that's by the by uh, in reality when you're looking at the planning policy. So the reason for refusal, um, there's the two reasons. Um, number one is the proposal is not a small gap within an otherwise substantial and continuously built up frontage as there is not a line of three or more buildings along a road frontage. The key issue here is that the building on site three has been approved but has not been constructed, so there is no building. Uh, and therefore, uh, there's no gap really to fill in. And the second reason then relates to the impact on the rural character. Uh, because it's not an infill opportunity, when viewed with existing buildings, it would change the rural character of the area um, and uh, be contrary to the policy in that respect. Okay. Um... Members, at this point, we have um, representation by planning agent in support of the application, uh, Mr. Leslie O'Donnell. Uh, you're very welcome to the committee. 
um, as per the previous applications, we have 10 minutes allocated and I'll maybe indicate around nine minutes. Um, so in your own time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to discuss this one. It really uh, boils down to policy CTY8 uh, because we can see that CTY14 arises from uh, that one. So if I focus on it, um, it's really uh, a question of what does policy CTY8 mean precisely by the term building? Um, and within the text, it says that the definition of a substantial and built up frontage includes a line of three or more uh, buildings along a road frontage. Um, it doesn't necessarily precisely define what a building is. Uh, and we all think we know what a building is, but really, uh, when I did my homework on this, um, I, I had a few doubts. Uh, literally, if we take the word literally, the OED defines the word building as meaning that which is built. Um, also, as part of my homework on this planning application, uh, I found one where a gap site in very similar circumstances to this one was approved by Derry City and Stadbarn Council. Uh, the reference number of that one is LA 11 2019 0035 if anyone would like to have a look at it. But in their determination, uh, Derry City and Stadbarn Council reckoned that since the adjoining site had commenced with the buildings board, uh, building control inspected it and were satisfied uh, that a material start had been made. Uh, it was then stated in the planning report that it was decided that this approval had been implemented, started, that therefore must be considered to be a commitment in the landscape. They were talking about the site beside the gap site, uh, which is the same situation as we have now with this application. Uh, in our case, the applicant also adjoins uh, or owns the site adjoining the application site and is likewise committed to implementing the planning approval in that one. Um, we have then a kind of a difference of opinion between areas. Uh, my view is this is an overall planning matter and it shouldn't differ between councils um, and that precedence has been set by the other approval. Um, in the case of Mr. Donnelly's site, um, he also has uh, had his foundations poured, as you can see from the aerial photograph, and it was inspected by building control, uh, the same as the other one. So in short, based on the precedent set by the site uh, approved by Derry City and Mr. Barham, uh, I would request that the application be approved. Thank you. Uh, apologies. Uh, we do have time for any questions. I thank Mr. O'Donnell for his contribution to date. Uh, if there's any questions for the agent, we can take them now, members. Mm. Councillor Irvine. Thanks very much. Um, in, in your representation, you stated that the um, partly developed area uh, that has foundations poured is in the ownership of the applicant for this um, proposed gap site. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, yes. Right, and it's, it's it's immaterial to 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 us uh, what's happening, but um, I presume as this um, pr presents a problem in establishing what is a gap site within our jurisdiction, that it obviously is within the gift of your uh, applicant to do something about that, and that then may negate the problem that's sitting here in regard to a definition of a gap site. That's just posing a information to you, not looking for an answer. Thanks. Councillor Yardy. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, 
and 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 thank you to Ms. O'Donnell as well. Just touching on what Councillor Irvin has asked there, just to clarify that that um, the foundations were poured there. I suppose the question would be: Is the applicant committed? The, the, uh, are you aware to developing that um, as a site? Because that if that was the case or developed more, it would be. Um, very clear cut, but um, both are in his ownership. But are you suggesting, or are you aware that he is committed to developing what uh, that 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 site uh, on the plans? Yes, he's he's very determined uh, to go ahead with that site. Um, he does own a couple of other sites in the locality, uh, and his intention is that once he gets this this one sorted out, he can make a start on the whole thing as it were as a, as, as a project um the fact that he is you know he has spent a fair bit of money on, on getting his foundations in and getting his applications approved and all the rest of it um he's he's not going to change his mind he's going to go ahead thank you chair i suppose it's just in other circumstances when we may have been presented with something like this that site may have been in different person's ownership and we couldn't establish the intent of the individual, but just to clarify, you're clarifying that the applicant in this case is willing to develop that site and therefore um, does really um, present the infill site as you're suggesting and referring to regarding your other uh, example from Derry City and Strabon Council, yes? Sorry, did, did you hear that, Mr. O'Donnell? Oh, sorry, that was addressed to me. My, my apologies. Uh, yes, um, I, I think it's uh, it's very similar as to you know the the circumstances of of both examples, um, but in this case, uh, as as the councillor quite rightly pointed out, my, Mr. Donnelly is uh, he owns both, and it's in his interest to to proceed with uh, the the adjoining application and with this one once he gets it gets it sorted out um the point made previously to that about it's within his control to um get this sorted out um uh, reading between the lines that means if he was to develop something we wouldn't have this question now uh, his feeling is that um Again, it's it's sort of putting the cart before the horse. Um, you know, he's going to have to develop something in order to get this. Uh, whereas his feelings are that he, he has already commenced and that has been confirmed by building control. Um, and as I say, we have that precedence. Okay, members, any other questions or? Our agent, why do we have him connected here? So no one is indicating. So um, I do thank uh, um, thank the agent, Mr. Donald, for speaking to the committee. And I'm now going to ask our planning officers if they wish to make any comment, Darren. Uh, yeah, yeah Councillor, just in, in relation to the policy um, and the, the tests within the policy, like it's clear on uh, page five there, you know, we've gone into it in detail. The policy does ask for a line of three or more buildings. You know, that is, that's black and white and as such in that it says that it must be a building. Uh, the question then is, well, what is a building? And I think uh, if everybody takes a, a everyday common meaning of that, you know, walls and a roof, would be a building walls as well without a roof you'd be even in that territory you could argue it's it's a building so the fact there is no building there to me is a fundamental policy conflict uh, and the intent of the developer or his future intentions the fact he owns it that's all fair and well but the policy doesn't talk about that the policy talks about the need for a building and without a building you, you know you're contrary to the policy the dairy example is a one example um there are plenty of other examples uh, several have been to this committee where we have said as a council that in the absence of a building there's no gap and i, I do not bring those to you uh, every, every site must be considered on its merits we must look at them in individual cases uh, so therefore i don't as a as an officer present those to you um, but certainly as a consistent approach within this council we would be looking at building on these sites
Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks very much, uh, with Darren. I'm in agreement with Darren. Uh, we're talking about a building. We're, we're not even seeing shale. Um, we're being asked to consider that uh, foundations and digging out constitute a building. It possibly constitutes commencement, but it's not a building. Um, and no application for a club has been put in uh, in that regard. We have an indication that uh, building controls say that work has commenced. So what? We've got no evidence of that. We have had other um, similar, but not exactly the same, applications that have been in front of us. And we have determined that it has to be a structure that we can deem to be a building, whatever condition it's in. Um, I probably take against the point uh, from the agent on behalf of the applicant that the adjoining uh, piece of land that has the area in dispute is within the ownership of the uh, applicant. Uh, I would suggest that we're not doing it uh, the roundabout way. The correct way, in my opinion, would be to develop uh, what he owns, first of all, and then consider looking, is there a gap site that he can duly apply for? And it would fall possibly then within the conditions of the policy and maybe meet the policy conditions. Um, in my opinion, it doesn't. And in that, I am going with the officer's recommendation, and I am proposing that we go with the officer's recommendation to refuse the application. Thank you. Thanks, Lord Garrity. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks, Ian Doran, and I, where I respect Councillor Irvine's position and uh, can say that we have made decisions like that before. The difference for me is that the ownership is in the same applicant's name and if they have committed and are willing for whatever reason or whatever their circumstances are to develop, I would believe that um, the agent is telling um, the true facts regarding that. Um, that's where I take a different approach on it. Um, if this was owned by a third party, I would have to question whether that development, now of course perhaps um, it could have been done the other way about, but maybe the applicant has his or her own reasons for doing that. Um, with, bear, with that in mind, I would go back to the agent's position um, when he referred to that one isolated case where we could view the foundations and the work to date as, um, as Councillor Irving suggested, a, a start, a development, um, and, and view it as that, in which case it would make the um, infill site um, where the applicant has proposed it. Um, I would be content with that, as I say, it's solely on the basis of the ownership and the intent, which has been outlined by the applicant. It is so difficult for people to get planning in the countryside, and um, everyone, it's such a prized possession for whatever reason, and I'm sure it's no different for this applica applicant and their reasons for it, I'm sure um, it would, would be genuine. Um, I'm a real advocate for people who live in the country and are trying to get planning. Um, there's, we're proposing big sites and towns. It doesn't necessarily suit anybody. So for that reason, um, I'm content because it's an ownership of, of Mr. Donnelly that um, he will commit to that site. And therefore, there is a gap site, which, which means I don't support refusal number one. And I don't believe um, that and refusal number two, that it is going to result in a suburban style built up area. It looks very uh, much the countryside where they are there and another house is not going to make um, a difference to it at all, in, in my opinion. So therefore, Chair, um, I wouldn't support the recommendation to refuse and I would propose that we approve um, permission for this site um, as it stands. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thanks to Mr. O'Donnell, the agent, for presenting here today. Uh, I'm, I suppose I'm uh, in the same vein as Councillor Garrity with regard to the foundations. And uh, after all this discussion, I've been prepared to second Councillor Garrity's proposal. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Just uh, Philip Kingston has asked to make a comment here, so go ahead, Philip. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, members, obviously, um, the agent has referenced a couple of um, issues involving Derry City and Stavane District Council. I would point out that both of those matters predate 
um, a recent uh, decision in relation to a leave application that was handed down by Mr. Justice Schofield uh, in relation to an application for leave to um, seek review of a, a gap site um, brought by Mr. Gordon Duff. And one of the points which he made when granting um, or when indicating the threshold for leave in relation to that is that you need to make a distinction between matters which are properly matters of planning evaluation and matters which are matters of fact and he specifically relates refers to the ascertainment of physical features on the ground um, now the point that's being made in relation to the officer in this case is that um, the existence of a building is a physical feature on the ground rather than necessarily a matter of planning evaluation um, so I think members need to be very clear of the basis upon which they would be if they were minded to go against the officer recommendation in relation to this case. They would need to be very clear of the basis upon which they decided to overturn um, that recommendation. And I, I think it would be struggling a, a little bit to say that it was on the basis that a building existed on the ground when in this instance a building doesn't exist on the ground. Members would need to come up with an alternative reason. Councillor Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I was just uh, going to ask Darren's opinion uh, in relation to the, the points that Councillor Garrity makes. Uh, and that is uh, what we know that the uh, site uh, that has been given planning approval and the foundations have been laid for this dwelling. And the agent has uh, stated that um, you know, it is the intention of the applicant to uh, develop uh, a building. And I suppose it is the case that if that building uh, was already erected, there wouldn't be an issue about this as an infill opportunity. I suppose if we were to uh, uh, recommend approval for this gap site, ultimately it wouldn't change the outcome in terms of the development in the countryside. You know, it would be uh, an infill opportunity and there would be uh, uh, those buildings along that frontage. Um, so I do feel that that is a material consideration. I mean, it is different if um, the, the, the site where the foundations have been laid um, were not in the ownership of the applicant. And uh, the applicant has really stated that um, he intends to develop that. Uh, further and uh, you know when he has an opportunity for doing so so in terms of uh, I mean are we not nitpicking really because ultimately uh, you know we're not really altering uh, the, the ultimate outcome uh, of this uh, uh, piece of development so I'd just be, be interested in the planning officer's comments on that chair thank you Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say, uh, Councillor, you sort of hit the nail on the head um, in terms of the outcome. Uh, the difficulty for the Council as a corporate body is defending a decision to approve. Uh, and I think Philip has touched upon that um, because the planning policy is very clear uh, and anybody reading it, it's very clear that there needs to be a building for there to be a gap. Now, there's no building here, so therefore, the, really, it doesn't meet the policy. Now, if members take that approach and say it doesn't meet policy, but here's why we wish to approve it, you're entitled to do that. And one of the ways you could do that is to say that, well, what's the point in him withdrawing, building the building and coming back in six months' time when he's a building built, then we'll approve it. So, you know, the ultimate outcome wouldn't change. So it's how you come forward with your recommendation, I think, is the key issue here. You cannot say it meets planning policy, but you can disapply the policy for a genuine planning reason. And if you can present that, then certainly you can approve the application. But that reason has to be a sound planning reason, as I say, and that's what Philip's warning about the chances of judicial review. It's an increasing threat out there, and there are objections to this. So we as a council need to be sound in our decision here. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think given the intervention from Philip, and uh, I mean, we're hearing that the, the the intention is to develop this site, but there's really no evidence of, of it being developed. It it has just simply had a foundation laid, and and it's it 
it's not ongoing. There's there's no evidence of building materials on site. There's no evidence of of, of anything more than purely a preparatory act. And, and I would find it hard at this stage. It, it seems a silly way to go around it, but if the other house was built then and it came back to us, then it would be quite easy for us to to recommend it. In fact, it probably would never even come to this committee at all. And and if that's the case, I, I can't see how we go against, I can't see how we play with words to try and circum circumnavigate what, what is now legal opinion that we've been given. So I would be uh, going with the officer's recommendation that we don't recommend at this stage. And second, Councillor Irvine's proposal. Thank you, Glenn. Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. If I could just seek clarification, uh, uh, am I right in reading this paragraph that uh, the visual inspection of the site and from views on aerial photos indicating that some work has commenced on the site in the past, although the site has since overgrown with grass, there is no work currently on site and the permission has now expired? Is that the previous planning application that has now expired? Yeah, so the photograph on the screen there shows the condition of the site, remember, so you can see. Uh, it has overgrown with grass, it's rough grazing, really, um, if anything. Although the previous slide does show, you can see the outline there of what appears to be the trenches. So some work has commenced on site, something has started. When that started, et cetera, et cetera, the agent has put in the building control uh, details of that. So I'm not going to argue with that. But as I say, it's almost a red herring. Um, the um, expiry date has passed. So it was granted to, uh, under a 2007 reserve matter. So the date for them commencing has long passed. However, they may have commenced it. Uh, and by all the evidence before us, it looks like they did. But I say that is almost a red herring here. The policy is looking at building. We don't have a building. And that's the key test for us. I, say, I know it does sound a bit strange, but if the applicant goes away and his intent is to build it and he builds it and goes back in six months, you won't see the application. And it goes straight through more um, without a hesitation. But um, as a council, finding a form of words to sustain the approval now is something we need to, to nail down. And, and could I ask further to that? Uh, I, I think I heard from the, the agent there that the foundations are in. Is that, that's what the agent submitted? Mm -hmm. Well, therefore, if the foundations are in, am I not right that if once you have your foundations in and if, if they've got a certificate from building control, that that retains your plan and application? Yeah, it would, yeah. Um, I suppose, I think the word expired is used in the uh, in the report, but it's really that it's past the date for starting, but it does appear that they have started in time and it's been banked. So they could continue on with this uh, and build it out very easily. Right, so could you clarify again then for me, Darren? Yeah. Uh, the plan and permission, once the foundations are in and they're approved by building control, that plan and permission really hasn't expired? The expiry really refers to the date of commencement. That's what the wording of it is, so it's maybe not as clear as it should be. If I can clarify it, it'll be crystal clear here. The evidence is that he did start in time and he could continue work and he could build that house. There's no issue for us, as I say. Uh, that, 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 I believe, is the critical issue here. And, and, and even despite the legal advice, if I was content that the, the foundations were on the, the, the previous site and that they had been certified by building control and given my understanding that that leaves your plan and permission uh, in existence until such times as you decide to proceed with the building. So therefore, if that's the case that the other plan and permission is still in place, Although that's that's not what we're getting in our, our report here, which is making it very difficult. It's very hard to go against it when we're reading here that the permission's expired. But my understanding is if the foundations are in, building controls approve them, that you can return to that uh, uh, planning, previous planning application at any time. That would mean that, that the, the, the earlier site is still possibly to be developed and uh, and uh, uh, you know to say a building but once building starts which is putting in the foundations again that's building work so you know we can dance on words uh, I'm, I'm i'm compromised on this one because in the report it says it's expired if if it's definitely expired well then i would have problem granting the, the, this application 
But if it's still a live application that could be developed, it could be, and we're, we're, we can't guess what the developer wants to do, but uh, obviously if we got a second permission, it probably would be fair to say that the building of the two dwellings would proceed. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with this one, as I say, given that the report says it's expired, but yet when, when I, I asked the question and the understanding of a plan and application still been in place, uh, it should be still in place. So it shouldn't actually say that the plan and permission has expired in the report. Would that be right? No. Uh, and I'll just repeat some of the words back to you, Councillor Jay. I think Philip's advice here is very important. and We are all dancing on the head of a pin. Uh, you use the words, proceed with the building. You know, comments they got demonstrate there's no building here, and we need to decide as a council, are we going to say it meets the policy or not? If it doesn't meet the policy, that's fine, but you need to give a reason why, and that could be that there's approval for a building and the guy could come back and uh, in six months' time and get approval. You know, those sort of comments, but if you're trying to argue there's a building here, that to me, as Philip pointed out, is a dangerous route, and I wouldn't see that as a sustainable route in terms of any challenge we get. It's a case of we're saying it doesn't meet policy, but we approve it because an X, Y, and Z. So essentially, Darren, um, you're saying that there may be no material change in an approval now or an approval at some point in the future after that uh, work has continued or finished? Well, what I'm saying is he could finish, he could go out tomorrow and build yeah. that house. Yeah. That's essentially the question before everybody today. He could, but he hasn't. He's had approval since 2007 and all he's done is the foundations and he, his site is set. So there's no intent on the ground. There's no physical works on the ground. There's no intent on the ground. You have a developer saying or an agent saying he'll do it. You know, that again, your policy says there needs a building. There's no building there, so you don't meet the policy. You're then into this discussion about all those other issues and coming up with a sound reason that can be defended on judicial review as you've seen in Derry. Uh, that's the issue before us. Or alternatively, he, you refuse and he comes back in six months when he's a built, and then that's a safe and sound decision for the council. Councillor Irving. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, we're turning on technicalities here, but we deal with legislation mm -hmm. and we have to deal with technicalities and we have to deal with policy. Um, I'm clear, and that's why I went with my proposal, that there isn't a building there, okay? So if there's not a building there, Councillor Garrett has come in and said, well, we'll make an exception. And she's perfectly able to clarify this, an exception because it has been stated by the agent on behalf of the applicant that the adjoining site that would appear to have uh, works commenced, but not substantive enough to be classified as a building, is in the ownership of the applicant and that there is an intent for the applicant to develop this current gap site along with the one beside it and ones elsewhere in the country. I'm sorry, but I have no evidence for that. It's only an intent expressed on behalf of the applicant by the agent. There is nothing in writing. There's nothing visible. An intent could change. Tomorrow, when circumstances beyond the applicant's control may take place, and he might have to sell up and everything. We don't deal with intent here. We deal with facts. And several of the members over the last preceding months and several years have hinged on facts rather than comments being presented to the committee. And all I'm hearing are comments from the agent on behalf of the applicant that there is an intent that the adjoining site is done partially and is going to go on. But there is no, nothing to say that that will happen. And because we are actually going outside the policy, we need to be very clear. And as far as I'm concerned, there is no clarity around why we're going outside the policy. And that's why I'm saying it's a refusal. Thank you very much. Councillor Garrity. 
Thank you, Chair Vladimir, again, and I think the debate has been interesting, um, certainly, well, that we've had to date. And uh, just on the back of Councillor Evans' position, and I do respect his position, but I can remember when I was sitting in your seat, Chair, um, as Chair of this Planning Committee, where legal advice was ignored by the same councillor. So I'm not going to be, you know, we deal with facts and not intent washes off me. Councillor Dehan is quite correct. We are, you know, are we nitpicking? And possibly we are. The last thing I want to do is get the council into any bother. I'm trying to, you know, provide homes and planning for people within the district of Fermanagh and Oma. That's why I like sitting on the planning committee. But um, I appreciate what um, Philip has said. And as I said before, that my last intent would be to bring this uh, um, group or committee into any sort of danger. But I do think that there is merit to the position that Darren said and Philip was how it is worded. And, and perhaps if we needed guidance on that, I still believe that this person um, has intent. And because of the ownership, and we are in it, but yes, it would be easier if the house was there. You know, there is, as Councillor McGuire said, the foundations are in, which means that can sit there for 10 years, another 10 years, and that planning can still be built. So we need to be careful of our own vocabulary that we're using within this chamber. That is accurate. So, um, Darren, I'm not sure to keep myself right and indeed the rest of the committee. I do feel strongly that there would be a genuine intent by the applicant to develop these sites. It was a pity. Though if the other one isn't done first, there could be good due reason for that. Is it suitable to say that this uh, foundation so is a commencement of a building, but perhaps too many does not constitute a building at this stage, um, doesn't quite meet the policy in its exact forms, but due to the intent which we believe and the ownership and the indication by the agent that it would be okay to approve permission uh, on that grounds? Um, if those wardens aren't aren't suitable or, or libelous or dangerous, uh, I will accept that. But I do think that this is just really a, a matter of time to that this happens. And I think it's a pity to have to come back with more money for the public again to come in to put a planning application towards yourselves if it really isn't necessary. I do accept the points from everyone to reason, but if there is a way around it, um, I would I would appreciate the advice on it, whether that's from Philip or Darren. Thank you, Chair. Um, okay, uh, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, thank you again, Chair. And as most like Councillor Gardy, I would seek more advice on it. And I hear exactly what Philip has said. And, uh, and I don't want to get this committee or this council into trouble. So therefore, at this stage, uh, I want to withdraw my seconding of uh, Councillor Gardy's proposal to keep this council in the straight and narrow. Thank you. Okay, members, any further comments? Councillor Dehan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, well, you know, I think uh, that it's right that we should have a debate on this issue, and uh, it is not our intention uh, uh, to violate planning policy and particularly uh, uh, to violate it in its intent, what our planning policy uh, intends to do in terms of protecting our countryside uh, and, and ensuring that any building within our treasured countryside uh, is suitable and appropriate. As Councillor Garrity has said, you know, um, people do have to live uh, uh, in, in houses and people, there is a demand for housing in the countryside. To me, it seems absurd, Chair, that we would put an applicant, that, uh, to me it would seem absurd that we would refuse this planning application and put the applicant uh, to the expense and inconvenience of submitting another planning uh, 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 application uh, once uh, the first dwelling is completed. Uh, the agent has already sta stated, if I recall correctly, that the applicant possibly wanted to develop both sides simultaneously. And like, I mean, there'd be good reasons for doing that. If there was machinery on the site, that both sites could be developed simultaneously. And the the uh, outworkings of that chair would be that you would have, you would meet the planning policy. So, 
we might meet the planning policy uh, in, in letter then uh, and now we would be meeting the spirit of the planning policy and we would not be detracting uh, from uh, the environment within our, within our countryside. And I think it would be really absurd if we were to turn down this application and get the applicant to bring it back once he has the first uh, dwelling completed. Uh, and, and in that case, the application would just uh, go to the officers for a delegated decision, wouldn't involve us. It, to me, it's nitpicking. It's not in the spirit of the uh, uh, planning policy. And uh, Chair, on the basis of that, I would be happy to second uh, Councillor Garrity's proposal, Chair. Thank you. Yep, just bring Darren in for yeah. a comment. Uh, so Councillor Garrity, Councillor Garrity had asked for advice, really, uh, members here. So um, having listened to the debate and the discussion that's gone on um, in terms of the, the proposal that's been put forward, um, the view of officers would be, and having listened to your discussion and debate, uh, the view of officers would be that that can be summarised as saying that this application does not meet planning policy. Um, however, uh, you consider that the policy can be disapplied as there are good planning reasons to do so. Uh, namely, uh, the approval next door has commenced. Uh, the agent has demonstrated an intent to complete this and the applicant owns the permission. Um, this uh, completion would result in a building on site which will then create a gap site. And any subsequent application at a later date, as Councillor Dean has said, any subsequent application at a later date would then be approved. So therefore, there's no good reason or no demonstrable public harm to refuse this application as it currently stands. Councillor Garrity. Thank um, Darren for that clarity, because I say I think the, the intent's genuine within the chamber, and I do appreciate the different views and and uh, views of officers and councillors. But yeah, if that if that if that is correctly sums up what I was trying to say, I would happy with that. That it doesn't quite meet policy, but on the basis of all that has been stated and the intent and the ownership, I think it would be um, mind, you know, not not too bright of us to to not have the applicant coming back. So. Um, I would have that as a proposal. I think Councillor Dehan is happy to second that. Councillor Councillor Dehan. Yes, uh, Chair, I would be happy to second that, and I do want to thank Darren for putting the arguments uh, so succinctly. And I think that really does uh, sum up very accurately the points that we were trying to make in committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you and Councillor Maguire. Thank you, Margaret Lane. I'm inclined to say that's what I meant to say, Darren. <laughs> but but uh, if I could just ask, Chair, uh, is Philip still online and did he hear that? And if he could just give us some final legal guidance just before we take the vote on it. Right, the Chair, yes, I am online. I, I heard what Darren said and, and that, that is exactly the point uh, that, that it is. Um, it's, we, we're not saying that the policy is being applied here because there is a building in place. We're saying that the policy it doesn't apply in this case, but for the specific reasons that Darren outlined, we are prepared to move past policy in this particular instance. That's a defensible position. Thank you, Philip, and thank you, Darren. So, members, we have a proposal uh, from Councillor Garrity, seconded by Councillor Dehane. Are we all in agreement? Councillor Irvine. <laughs> Nitpicking again, um, Councillor Thompson withdrew his seconding of Councillor Garrity, subsequently seconded by Councillor Deegan, but Councillor McCluckery had seconded my proposal in the in-between. So technically my proposal is the first one that should go to the committee of Councillor Garrity's. And that's purely on procedure, Chair. Yep, absolutely. Sorry, my mistake. Uh, Councillor, thank you for spotting that. Yeah, so the, the first proposal to be seconded was Councillor Irvine's um, seconded by Councillor McLaughery and that was in support of the officer's recommendation to approve. Are members all in agreement? Councillor McLaughery? Refuse, sorry, refuse. Uh, are, are all members in agreement? Councillor McLaughery, you wanted in at this point? So I just wanted a quick question. Uh, obviously we're, we're going with intent. The, then there will be no comeback then if Site two is built on, and site one, which is originally there, is never built on. That that won't reflect badly on us.
you've raised an interesting point. Um, all I can say is that the information from the agent today demonstrates that he will start, uh, or sorry, complete, because he has started complete that first approval. Um, I'll be honest, on this specific site, even if that first one isn't built and he builds the one in the middle, given the buildings that are surrounding there, like there's a building on the to one side, there's a building across the road, it will not change the character of the area. So essentially that, that's the test that you'd be asking yourself. If they didn't build the first approval, but they built the one we're now granting, will it change the real character of the area? The answer to that is no, it won't. Okay, members, so I'm putting Councillor Irvine's proposal uh, to the committee, seconded by Councillor McLaughery, and that's uh, in support of the officer's recommendation to refuse the application. Are we all in agreement? No. So can I have hands in favour of Councillor Irvine's proposal? And those in favour are Councillor Irvine, Councillor Robinson and Councillor McLaughery. And those against? Those against are Councillor Maguire, Councillor Mc... Councillor Garrity, Councillor Coyle, Councillor Dehan, Councillor Rainey and Councillor Campbell. So that proposal falls. Um, moving now to Councillor Garrity's proposal, contrary to the officer's recommendation that we approve the application. That's been seconded by Councillor Dehan. Are we all in favour? All in agreement? No? So those in favour of the proposal? are Councillor Maguire, Councillor Garrity, Councillor Coyle, Councillor Dehan, Councillor Rainey and Councillor Campbell. And those against the application are Councillor Robinson, Councillor Irvine and Councillor McLaughery. So that application, that proposal has been carried and I'll ask Darren to sum up. Okay, members, so the application was recommended for refusal by officers. Uh, members have decided to go contrary to the officer's recommendation uh, for the reasons listed uh, previously within the, the minutes. Um, in terms then, members, of the um, the conditions, if I could ask that that could be delegated back to officers, because um, I really hadn't given any thought to conditions at this stage. So if I could be asked for that delegated back to officers, uh, there will be standard reasonable conditions relating to the retention of boundaries, road safety, etc., uh, things like that. Proposed by Councillor Maguire, signed by Councillor Gardy. Thank you. Yeah, I'll give you six. Just moving on now to application six members. <clears throat> is that what we start with? Yeah, well, there's a maybe a worthwhile question is will will we have time to is it reasonable to start at this stage? Uh, there is that risk will run out of time at 25 past six. And then it really has to be taken from the start at a reconvened meeting. Councillor Irvine. I, th I think that's a fair proposal. Uh, judging by the amount of debate that we've taken so far, um, I think this one, <laughs> looking at the side of it, could go on for a lot longer. Uh, I would make the proposal that we finish the committee now. Yeah, that's OK. Go ahead, Councillor Garrity. Councillor Garrity, sorry. Yeah, I think, and, and um, fair juice to yourself, I think it, the debates are running long and are interesting. I think we're hopefully we're learning all the time, but I would second Councillor Irvine um, that in case we don't get it finished and move it to the next day. OK, thank, thank you, you Councillor. And Councillor, sorry. Councillor Maguire. Uh, Glenn, uh, again, then, I was just going to recommend that maybe we could go to some of the other reports get them completed today they don't usually take much debate sure members are we all i know what i would propose is that we would continue and, and deal with the correspondence the other items on the agenda if that's okay uh we're all in agreement with that okay thank you and apologies to those who have sat for that application but it's it's uh it's the only practical solution really it makes sense in that regard um so moving on members to item eight and that is to note the schedule of planning decisions issued in February 2022. That's paper C. Councillor Irving. Thank you, Chair. Proposed noting. Proposed note. And Councillor Robinson. Second. Seconded. Uh, item oh. nine then is to note the update report on planning enforcement in February 2022, paper D.
proposal and out. Sorry, Councillor Coyle. No, well, Councillor Robinson was in first for you. I propose to note uh, I've read the report. Councillor Robinson. Back on it. Okay. Uh, item 10 then is to note the update report on planning appeals in February 2022. That's paper E. Councillor Irvine. Proposed noting, Chair. Thank you. Councillor McGuire. Um, item 11 is to note report on planning committee actions from November 2021 to January 2022, Paper F. Councillor Irving. Oh, proposed note, Chair. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor McGuire. I'm happy to second it and, and, and later to see there's nothing outstanding, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. So uh, item 12 then is correspondence. And uh, ask Paul to take us through those items. 12.1. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, members, uh, first item of correspondence then um, is just to note the uh, letter from the Department uh, for Infrastructure, uh, just re in relation to the judgment of, of Heartlands again. Um, and members will be aware we've, we've had ongoing correspondence back and forward between the DFI and DFC as well on this matter. Um, so it's just to uh, note that this letter sets out that DFI are also actively engaging with DFC, uh, but again, there is no timeline. Um, just to update members, we we have also written the DFC following last uh, month's committee, uh, asking for a specific timeline in relation to resolving this matter. Um, in terms of... Uh, you know, we, we, we have fed back to DFI as well. You'll see it in the correspondence there. They had requested some details of our recent calling. Um, we have fed back to them um, with some key bullet points just in terms of the delays and the additional workloads that that has had uh, for both officers and members. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. That. Um, the second part of that correspondence then um, is uh, in relation to the technical issues with the existing NI planning portal um, that occurred during January and February. Uh, and members will be aware that um, uh, we, officers advised in, in the February planning committee, committee um, just regarding the downtime and the effect that that had on workloads and performance. Um, and you will note there, members, in the correspondence that the delay uh, a significant delay in this instance was caused by the fact that um, the problem couldn't be fixed by the company that maintains the portal um, and external assistance was required on this occasion. Um, it is noted that the portal is now of some age and fixing the problems are becoming more challenging um, and as members know we'll be rolling out uh, a new IT uh, planning system later this year. Um, there is an apology for the disruption um, and it will be highlighted in the uh, upcoming stats. Thanks. Thanks, Irving. Yeah, Chair, happy to note the one, the one problem I would have with regard to the Heartlands is we're coming up to an assembly election in the absence of anybody at Stormont. How much is the department going to push this issue to try and take a decision through? Um, I'd just like some clarity on that. I think we should write back and just say because whilst they say they're pursuing it along with their sister department, that means absolutely nothing. Um, and we are living under the sort of Damocles. So uh, I believe we should write back and say, we welcome your correspondence, but we would really want uh, urgent extreme action on this in light of an impending storm and election. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, so that's a proposal. Um... We're all in agreement. Councillor Robinson, you're happy to second that. Second that proposal, and we're all in agreement. Okay, thank you. So, um, a proposal to note those two items of correspondence then, um, Councillor Deegan, Councillor McGuire, and I think we have one item of other correspondence. Um, two items, sorry. Yeah, just moving on to the other correspondence um, members. Um, First one there is from DERA, um, and we'll put this, we've tabled this for the meeting, 
um, just in the context um, of recent correspondence with DERA, both to the Minister and the Head of Natural Environment Operations, um, most specifically in relation to the various actions that DERA had been taken uh, to deal with their backlogs and their performance, um, and uh, specific concerns raised by members in relation to the decision to halt plan and consultation prioritisation requests. I suppose when you look at the stats members, um, you know, when you look at December, uh, total replies from DERA uh, is 25, 18's late, that's 72% of consultations coming back to officers late. In January, uh, 31 replies, uh, 19 late, again, 61%. Uh, of those consultation replies coming back late. And that is a significant impact on how officers uh, deliver a service and, um, in terms of performance. Um, in the previous correspondence, there was an acknowledgement from the Minister that the actions were temporary and that the uh, officials would engage with uh, council officers by the end of February, but I am not aware that that has happened. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, proposal to note that Councillor Irvine and seconded by Councillor Maguire. That's all our another item, just one more item, sorry. And the final piece of correspondence in uh, members is from the Chief Planner. Um, and it just it, it relates to the end of the emergency period uh, uh, in terms of the coronavirus regulations. And these uh, regulations were put in place in a te uh, temporary measure. Uh, they remove the requirement for a public consultation event for major applications, um, obviously because uh, the law and the guidance said that that shouldn't happen. Um, you will note that the emergency period had been extended for a few uh, occasions, um, but the chief planner is now saying that that won't be extended and it'll end at the end of March 2022. Um, so uh, after that date, when developers come forward with a, a proposal of application notice and they're going to engage with communities, then there will be a requirement again uh, for a public consultation event. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Opposed by Councillor Egan, seconded by Councillor Robinson. Uh, that brings us to item 13 on our agenda. Any other relevant business? Nobody is indicating. So. Um, Thanks very much, everyone, for your attendance, their officers. And oh, we have to do the confidential minutes. Sorry, apologies. Proposed by Councillor McGuire and seconded by Councillor Coyle. I'm Thank you. People will come back from the lobby, I think. Okay, member, just, just to confirm the confidential business, uh, members considered matters arising from the confidential minutes of the 26th of January 2022, and there were no matters arising. Oh, Councillor Coy, silent Councillor Robinson. That brings us to the end of our meeting. Um, if there's no more. Relevant business, thank you to all the members and the officers for their attendance and to our IT team as well. Uh, much appreciated. And we'll reconvene on Monday the 28th at uh, 10 a.m.